Good evening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the January 25th, 2023 school committee meeting. We are just returning from an executive session. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Our first order of business, we have our student representatives from the high school, Madison Benoit and Audrey Lacant. Come join us, please. It's nice to see you again. It's our favorite part of our meetings is hearing the updates. So hello and thank you for having us again. Over the past week, students have been taking mid-year exams for their full year classes and final exams for their half year classes. Quarter three will begin tomorrow, which means second semester classes will begin tomorrow and Friday. Last Saturday, our robotics team, the Wilmington Wired Wildcats, competed in a um, qualifying competition at Andover High School along with the two Wilmington Middle School teams. We won the Motivate Award for our community outreach, which included um, intro to robotics and CAD courses that we ran over the summer, a robotics program at the library that let kids drive a push bot and learn to assemble some basic parts, having a robotics table at the eighth grade parents' night, and presenting at a school committee meeting last year. Our next competition will be at Needham High School on February 5th. And clubs have also begun to go to middle school lunches and present about what their club is about. And so Model UN presented this month and Art Club and National Honor Society will be presenting in February. More will come in the spring. And this is a great way for middle schoolers to learn more about the clubs that we offer and how they can join when they come to the high school. Today, a teacher appreciation lunch was held by the PAC. Teachers were able to spin a wheel and win a prize, and members of the student council read out teacher shout outs that were sent in by students. The biology MCAS retakes will take place on February 1st and 2nd. Two students, Ali Abokal and Emma Flynn, entered the Young Writers Twisted Tales mini saga contest contests last fall and were selected to have their stories published in Twisted Tales U.S. Escapades Anthology coming this spring. The newly formed pep band has, attending vars has been attending varsity basketball and hockey games this season and it's been a big hit with everyone. The school counseling department hosted an alumni roundtable where four WHS grad graduates from the class of 2019 discussed their college experience with current WHS students. Um, and on January 9th, Lamplighters Drama Guild held a fundraiser at the Red Heat Tavern to help fundraise for their club. They have also begun rehearsing for their spring musical, which will be School of Rock. Course selection begins for underclassmen in early February. Students will get to learn about the different courses they can take, discuss options with their teachers, and submit their request by February 15th. We also now have a student rep's Instagram, so any community members and especially students can follow us at whs.student.reps for updates on topics of discussion at school committee meetings and opportunities for student involvement. And tomorrow, several juniors will be attending a girls' empowerment conference in Newton. So that's pretty cool. That is very cool. You're bringing this to a whole new level. I know. I just, I never know what to expect. With Mr. Gendron's weekly updates, I feel like I'm very in tune to all that's happening. So we're very pleased. Thank you so much for everything. Do you have any questions or comments for them? I just yeah. have to just jump on yeah. your, that, your I, I, it blows me away in Instagram. How long, do it, how long has Instagram be, you know, have been here? Um, because I'm not technologically literate either, but <laughs> to finally capitalize on that area of social media to, to get out the message and all the, all the work that you guys are doing um, behind the scenes. And congratulations on the award with the robotics. That's fantastic. Excellent. We're, we're, I'm still impressed by last, was it fall? Was it the fall of last year's presentation? Last year, I think, yeah. The robotic, you know, it's just, I love it. I'm Sorry. sure they'll be back. You'll come back, right? They'll come back, the robotics team. I can, I can ask. Every yeah. year they come and impress us. So thank awesome. you so much. Thank Continued you. success. I'm happy thank midterms you. are done for you, and we look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> We're all happy about that. I <laughs> we like the schedule, though, don't we? Oh, the yeah. schedule. Got out at like nine to be was great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Gendron. <laughs> I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of the midterm schedule, personally. 180 days of school. All right. Awful. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friends, um, we have approval of items by consensus, approval of minutes, January 18th, 2022. Mrs. Plowman, second by Ms. Mrs. Burns. All in favor? Abstain. Okay, one abstention. Jesse? Are you going to abstain? 
Um, no, because I watched it and I, well, do I have to abstain? I feel in tune to what happened. I have watched. I watched most of it live. I've read the minutes. I'm not going to abstain. But if I have to for any reason, you let me know. All right. We've got, are these correct? G23? Is that correct? Okay. I don't know why that looks funny to me. G23, R24, L5657, and FS36. Mr. Fennelly, thank you. Second by Mr. Turner. All in favor? That is unanimous. We have sped 28. Mr. Fennelly, again, for the win. Second by Mr. Ragsdale. All in favor? And that is one abstention. All right, that brings us to you, Dr. Brand. That's our superintendent's report. Uh, very brief, I know, surprising, but very brief tonight uh, with one item, and that is superintendent's goals update, which uh, I'll speak briefly to. Uh, there is an item in the packet. Just wanted um, to try and provide an update to the committee on uh, two uh, relevant um, developments regarding the goals, the goals that you approved uh, earlier this year for uh, myself as your superintendent. The two that are highlighted there, uh, which uh, activity has commenced. The first one, goal number one, around culture and climate assessment. You'll recall that uh, one of the... Uh, one of the areas of focus is trying to assess um, uh, our culture and climate throughout our learning communities throughout the district. Um, as I've said before, and I believe passionately in uh, the best way to provide environments in which uh, students can learn and educators can help teach is to have strong cultures uh, in place in schools. And so uh, this is an effort to try and pull together uh, a group of representatives of which are included on uh, page two of the memo. Uh, I was so, so thankful for the interest that we had across the board. No one's been turned away, which is also great, but we have broad representation as you can see, including uh, students, uh, staff, uh, school leaders, and parents guardians as well. Uh, and um, uh, the intention is to bring this group of folks together uh, very quickly here actually, uh, and to develop a tool, uh, if you will, that we can use here in the district uh, to uh, gather information, uh, data on school culture across the district and how we're going to go about uh, doing that, when we're going to do that, the questions that will be asked, and how those results will be shared. And I think that that's an important point there just to, uh, to end on. So um, I'll keep you updated on this as it moves forward, but uh, really excited and looking forward to the contributions and ideas of those that have uh, stepped forward to be a part of this. Uh, the second goal is the next strategic plan for the Wilmington Public Schools. As you know, our, uh, our, our current plan really has, has expired for all intents and purposes. Uh, just yesterday, uh, an uh, announcement went out to the entire community uh, looking for volunteers to be a part of this effort. Um, and uh, so we're still in the very early uh, phases of this, but I've been working closely with Ms. Elliott. We put together a plan, uh, including dates and schedules. And if all goes as planned, it will be by uh, certainly June, in which you should have before you as a school committee uh, a proposal for your consideration to serve as the next three-year strategic plan for the Wilmington Public Schools. So I will keep you posted on those that step forward to hopefully also uh, be part of that and the interest uh, hopefully is there across the district. We are again looking for representatives from our staff, uh, students. I'm hopeful to have uh, two to three students looking to include a couple of high school students as well as an eighth grade student if, uh, if uh, there's interest there. And as always, of course, parent guardians and community members. So uh, if you're interested or if you know someone, uh, we're looking, it's a sh rather short turnaround time, but by Monday, I think we said, right? Um, uh, for those that might be interested. And I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you might have on this, but that is it for superintendent's report this evening. Thank you. Questions or comments? Okay, excellent. Um, moving right along, we're on new business. And first up, we have our Wilmington High School World Languages Department presentation, um, the Exchange Student Program. Come and please join us. <coughs> Welcome, nice to see you. Thank you, hello. I assume this clicker clicks. <laughs> should click. All right. So hello, uh, my name is Teresa Pietro and I teach Spanish here at the high school. I've been here for the past 18 years and over that time have led uh, five student trips to Costa Rica, awesome student trips to Costa Rica. And during the pandemic, when travel ceased, I started to think about um, shifting my focus to something that could be equally awesome and that is a Spanish exchange program. So that is why I'm here tonight. 
So um, some of my most transformational high school experiences involved my family's participation in, in my school's exchange programs. We hosted students from Spain, from Germany, from France. Um, each student spent three weeks with us, and they um, became just one more of the Pietro clan. Um, they were very eager to become part of our, our daily family life, and they jumped right in, helped cook, um, played with my little siblings, got schlepped to sporting practices, and um, one of them even created some art for our playroom. Um, we were equally impressed by their uh, English skills, their curiosity for life in America, and um, we were very touched by their, uh, the letters that their parents sent us, um, just you know, bubbling over with gratitude for us having opened our homes um, to their students. This student right here holds a special place in my heart because um, I participated in the reciprocal part of the exchange and stayed with Adriana and her family for three weeks in Bocholt, Germany. And um, it was so nice to, uh, it was the first time I actually had traveled out of the country, first time traveling without my family, and it was really nice to, to be in this unfamiliar place and be created by a friendly face because she had spent three weeks with us um, before that. Um, this trip was uh, opened my mind to so many, so many new things, and it's a central piece of why I have chosen to uh, make languages and learning about different cultures a, a part of my life. And so I would like to provide a similar experience for the kids of Wilmington. Uh, in terms of the educational impact of exchange programs, there are many. And if you look at our mission statement, our goal is to educate our kids to become part of a global society. And an exchange program will help to bring that, uh, give them that, a taste of that global society firsthand. They'll be able to apply their world language skills and intercultural communication skills in an authentic setting. Um, they'll learn about the impact of culture and history on our daily lives and on, on the lives of, of our partners, our global partners. They'll be able to practice SEL skills through self and social awareness, relationship building, um, and the list goes on. Um, we offer a lot of travel experiences here at Wilmington High School, but we don't do any cultural exchanges. And from the language teacher's perspective, an opportunity like this is a real um, accelerator for language learning when you know you have that goal to shoot for and it um, helps to motivate kids to stick with language learning after the experience as well. Uh, it also provides an opportunity for students and families who may not be able to travel, a chance to have a taste of this in their own backyard. So um, if you're not familiar with exchanges, there is a video linked to the presentation that, that really gives the perspective of someone who has participated, both students and teachers. So I encourage you to watch that. Um, before, we wanted, uh, before we decided to go too much further with this idea, we decided to survey the families of students currently enrolled in Spanish classes to see if the, there is an interest. And we did this in uh, December, got about 50 responses, and over 50% of those responses expressed interest in hosting or potentially hosting, and over 70% expressed interest in traveling as an exchange student. So um, we decided to take the next step. And uh, this is our proposal. Um, I'm proposing an 11 day exchange with a school in Spain during next school year. So the Spanish students would travel here to Wilmington in September and we would travel to Spain in April. We would be traveling with a company called Forum by Promotor. They have about 30, uh, 30 years of experience in student travel and, and they specialize in exchanges. Um, they've worked closely with many towns in Massachusetts and have spoken to at least three teachers who have worked with them and they've all had nothing but positive to say about them. Um, Forum would be in charge of all the travel logistics, plane tickets, travel insurance, any extra excursions, um, support while we're, we're there and the other school is here. And they also um, partner us up with a school in Spain. And they've actually already done this piece and I've been con in contact with the teacher at the Centro Educativo Agave, which is a K through 12 private school um, in Almeria, Spain, which is in the southern part of Spain in Andalusia. Uh, the school, 
um, has a, a great emphasis on language learning, particularly English and French, and they have an active history of participation in exchange programs. So it'll be nice to be partnered up with someone who has done this before. And it'll be the role of um, myself and the other teacher to develop the programming for each of our respective visits, as well as arrange for host families. So in terms of the hosting logistics, uh, the specific dates that the uh, Spanish kids would be in Wilmington um, are Wednesday, September 13th through the 24th. They would actually fly into New York City, spend a couple of days there, and then come to Wilmington. And so what we would need to do is find 10 to 15 um, host families and um, a couple of uh, families to host one or two chaperones. Um, the responsibilities of the host families are to provide a safe and welcoming environment for the students, a chance to practice English and learn about American culture, provide three daily meals and transportation between home and school, and to include the student in daily family life. And then on the community side, um, we would put together a program for that visit. Um, it would include school visits and community visits, so it could be one to two days of the Spanish students shadowing the host student here at the high school. But I mean, it's really very open. We could arrange for programming with the middle school, with elementary schools. We could reach out to WCTV for a tour of the studio or um, you know, conduct an apple pie making workshop with the cafeteria staff or the, the senior center. We would absolutely have to visit the school committee and learn about how <laughs> school governance works in Massachusetts. Um, and so, yeah, anything we want to show off and, and share about our community is, is, is open. Um, we would also, I would also put together a calendar of additional activities to help support host families with ideas for after school, whether it be sporting events or if a host family wants to organize bowling night or, or whatever. So we would help support that as well. And then we'd organize some sort of welcome reception and farewell reception as well. Um, on the opposite side, in April, Wednesday, April 10th through the 20th, we would travel to Spain. And we would have a reciprocal experience. So all that hospitality that we will have put forth um, to the, to the visiting Spanish students, they will reciprocate for us. Um, so the idea is that our, our Wilmington students would stay with the families of the students that they host. And I should mention that host families are not financially compensated for hosting, yet this is where they get the return on their investment. Um, and same deal with the school and community visits. Uh, we would also tack on two days of excursions to our trip. Um, to Granada and Malaga, and that would be organized by Forum um, as we depart from the Malaga airport. In terms of eligibility, um, I do want to stress that this is not a trip, but a cultural exchange. Um, so, so students that would have the most um, success, I guess, in this, uh, on this experience is someone, or someone who would have language skills, um, and a maturity and open mind to the fact that it is a cultural experience, um, cultural exchange, that they're gonna be outside of their comfort zone. They're not gonna be eating the same things or you know, have access to the same things. Or, and and that's, that's the point, that is the purpose of this adventure. So we would wanna make sure that our students understand that. Uh, we would ask that they're in good academic and disciplinary standing, that they submit an application of interest just so that we can get an understanding of their motivation for participation. And then ideally, because the magic is in the reciprocal nature of the exchange, um, ideally they would be able to both host and travel. However, there will be consideration of any individual circumstances. So I will leave it there and open it to questions, as I'm sure there are many. Thank you so much. Questions or comments? Mrs. Plowman? Um, this is kind of related to the maturity aspect and, and will there be a, like an interview process and sort of a vetting of is this student really, I mean, the excitement of, you know, being able to do something like this, I would just be concerned that a student would be overly eager at the prospect of this and then get there and 
three or four days in just be terrified <laughs> and want to bail. So like what is the process that a student would go through to sort of make sure and is there you know are parents involved in that conversation and et cetera? Yeah. yeah yeah I mean it's the first time we're doing it so we would you know come up with something I definitely would want to meet the students and have the conversation with them um, one of the nice things about the way this is timed is that the host students would come here first so that our Wilmington students will get comfortable with them and they'll be really excited that the idea is that they will be really excited to go and travel there um, so so it, they won't be going in completely cold um, we meet every day at school except for the weekends so we'll always have like a, a session together the Wilmington kids meet with the, the students in the mornings to have those check-ins so they'll always know that and in the day and age of cell phones we are like a text away so so those are some things that would hopefully make them feel a little bit more comfortable, but there will definitely be conversations going into it. Just a follow mm -hmm. What happens if a student does have to bail? <laughs> <laughs> Melissa. I'm just, I'd just like to know where the emergency exits are, please. There, there will be a contingency plan <laughs> to be developed, and we'll get back to you on the specifics. I work with but very yeah. anxious children, so yeah. I think so, about these things. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> But send, send in the SEAL teams. And <laughs> Is that you? <laughs> Are you going to parachute in? Uh, I do know from working with other companies <laughs> that coordinate travel, not only exchange, but other trips, that most programs do have built-in emergency measures for medical events, uh, family emergencies, disciplinary events when a sudden change happens and a student mm -hmm. needs to leave unexpectedly. Um, so I think we could research with that company to see what their game plan is and then report back. Okay. We'll call it the Plowman plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, MJ. I like I'm it. Uh, <laughs> Try not to give up my day uh, job. Mr. Turner. So thank you very much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, two, two questions. One, in the Wilmington activities piece, it was school visits for two days. Would the host families be obligated for any of the transportation from the other 10 days beyond? Because it says in here, get them to the schools. Yeah. Well, well, on the days they're not at the school, does right. the host family have any other obligations for transportation? So the host family is responsible um, on the weekends mm -hmm. for whatever activities they're going to be doing together. In terms of the stuff that we're organizing during the school day, those are all like logistics that we'll have to work out uh, over the course <laughs> of this. It's one of those things where um, we kind of need to figure out if we're going to go for it before we can get into all those nitty gritty details. And we will arrange activities that work with whatever we have you know the parameters whether it be walking to the train station or mm -hmm. you know doing activities in the area so so Makes sense. yeah and then in terms of in terms of the, the cost to students who choose to participate obviously the hosting piece covers um, the, ho the equivalent of hotel lodging <coughs> um, airfare would be the main cost and would there and presumably pocket money and presumably some of the meals mm -hmm. would be the total cost um, yeah so if you under travel logistics yeah. there's a link to the um, the itinerary, our itinerary for travel. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, on the pricing okay. pages Isn't towards it? the end. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. So that includes airfare, the excursions at the end, um, any ground transportation from the airport to the school, um, the chaperone trips, and the support while we're over there. Mrs. Burns. Sorry. Um, I just, I, I know one of my questions was. Um, the financial mechanism mm -hmm. to su support this and want it to be accessible mm -hmm. to all. Um, are there, I'm not sure how other, because we're, I'm sure we're not alone in that, um, in, in that goal to, to try to be as open and accessible. Um, I'm sure other districts face similar. Um, how are we going to approach that with this particular, this is a, a bit unique. So I know that they've been fundraising for the, the big trips out of the country and such, I, I just didn't know what mechanisms that we might be able to tap into. Great question. Um, for the, you know, because this is so soon, I actually do have some leftover funds from my Costa Rica trips okay. that I could help use to defray some of the costs for kids who needed it. Um, this same thing, fundraising, you okay. know, I, we're willing to support that as well. And I started Googling, I have to do more research on this, but there are grants or scholarships out there for kids who participate in exchanges. I just need to figure out if it can be any high school exchange or if it's tied to a specific program. But but yes, we 
Because I remember back in my day, decades ago, it, it was for a whole year. You'd do a junior year, and, um, and, and then you don't, I didn't hear anything about it, and you only hear about it at the college level, but it's such a wonderful opportunity to bring it back at this level, though, because I think uh, it's a perfect time to expand those, broaden those, that vision of mm -hmm. the world, and, you know, and I think the decision-making after, you know, the high school yeah. would be a huge impact. Uh, yeah. Mr. Smile. Um, yeah, so this looks fantastic. I really um, support this whole thing. One of the one of the questions that I have though is I know back before the, the pandemic there was a trip that had to be canceled because of the pandemic and there was, I don't remember exactly what it was, but there were some issues around refunds and things of that nature and I know that the company, I think a lot of these companies now have that built in and that's true of the company that you're working with too. So if students are putting you know money into this if it gets canceled for you know god forbid something happens but that's in there yeah so the, the, there is an insurance policy that is included in the trip cost i think there's an additional fee you can pay for a cancel for any reason um policy which this would be a cancel for any reason <laughs> okay. situation <laughs> yeah all right thank you it's sixty dollars and 75 cents extra okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> mr okay. ragsdale Somehow it seems to me a kind of a perfect commentary on the, um, parenting that when I was looking at the, um, what the host responsibilities are, it said provide three daily meals, and the first thing that popped into my head is like, but what about snacks? <laughs> <laughs> the very first thing that my kids would ask about that is, well, meals are well and good, but um, what's, what's the snack situation? Added bonus. Uh, so one step at a time. Um, but just to kind of get a sense of the thought, if this goes well, do we have an idea of then if this might be extended to students taking French and students taking Italian? I think that is the dream. Um, this is sort of a teacher-led endeavor. So if we got other teachers who wanted to leave the endeavor, then sure. And if I can maybe Mr. speak Gentron. a little bit more specifically <laughs> to that, like what you're seeing and hearing is really a testament to Ms. Pietro. Um, I'm here to show my support. Um, and I was involved in kind of asking some of these logistical questions to make sure we were ready to go for tonight. But this is something that's really been a passion of Ms. Pietro, and she's driven this. Um, you know, it's certainly not something that I could have developed or pushed, um, and without your involvement, like, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this right now. Mm -hmm. So I think that really is the catalyst for this Spanish exchange trip. Um, we'd love to provide as many exchange opportunities as possible, given kind of the manpower and bandwidth that people have. Um, also, the Spanish sub student subscriptions being the highest, it felt like kind of a high yield opportunity to come up with enough host and sending students. Um, but it's certainly something that we'd like to expand and explore. Mr. Fenley? Sort of building off what you just said, I know you surveyed the students, the families, and there seems to be a, a, a decent amount of interest, but is there a, like a minimum threshold you would need to meet in order to make this feasible? Like, if we only get six students who are interested, is it, does it not go off, or is there... Uh, like, is there some kind of a cutoff, essentially? I believe it needs to be 10. 10, okay, yeah. so 10 is the number. Yeah. Okay. And then, on the other end of that, if, you know, 15 maybe is the cap, what if there's 30 kids who, again, maybe the cart before the horse, but right. um, if it's, if it's, you know, there's more interest than you anticipated. How do you sort of play through that? I, I would say, because it's the first year, I would still want to cap it at about 15. Sure maybe 20 more on um, if there I, I think there is a huge interest in the Spanish kids coming here um, if there were 20 host families that were interested in hosting but only 15 kids that wanted to travel that is something we could consider I probably wouldn't want to travel to Spain with more than 15 20 again it being the first year but kind of see how that plays out <laughs> and commit after that. David's planning trips for everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <The> snacks. <laughs> uh, 
one other thing that Ms. Pietro did is reached out to other local schools, who high schools, who have exchange <coughs> programs. And so some of our questions that we weren't sure of the answer, we bounced to them. Uh, and they had some great practices. So that question is probably one uh, we could bring back to them and get some feedback. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I, too, am very supportive of this. I think it's great. And like David, I would love to see this expand a bit. Um, I do. There are a couple. I mean, I know there's a trip to Peru. Um, for next year, so there, and I happen to have a child who studies Spanish, so I'm like, oh great, you know, but I am <laughs> thinking about other children. I have a son who studies French, and so it's sort of just to make sure that it does feel like we are moving in that direction, I think would be exciting too. And that's not for you, I'm not giving that to you, I'm passing that to Mr. Jenren. Um, but I think it's exciting, and I think this is exactly the kind of thing we want to do in this district, and I organize study abroad programs for BU, and those are obviously semester longs, um, this is like the perfect amount, I think, for high school students, maybe longer, but I think it's a nice intro to what a study abroad semester could look like. And so I feel like students doing this as high school students will be much more likely to take advantage of semester or year long um, abroad trips when they're in college. So mm -hmm. I think it's great. Thank you so much for putting the time in and for being here and presenting it um, in such an organized way. And I, I think we're excited to see what's next. Right. Now there is a field trip approval. Do we need to do that? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Yes. All right, so the field trip approval form you'll see is, is yeah. I was going to just make a motion. Oh, go for it. Yes. I don't want to, my apologies. I didn't want to. Like, no more discussion. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I'd like to make a motion to approve the. Uh, field trip approval form. Field trip. <laughs> well, it's an, really an exchange program. Well, no, it's just the, this is just the um, approval form for the trip to Spain, right. which is April 10th through April 20th, 2024. That's second. what we're, sorry, so you made that, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a second, everyone in favor of approving this trip. And that is unanimous. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you for being Thank here, you. we appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right. We'll be back, you'll see us again. I think we can't wait, we're looking forward to it. Our next item of business, we have the Wilmington High School Course Selection and Program of Studies presentation. Come on down. This is like the bulk of our audience, so come join us. Are you all at once or are you taking turns? You're taking turns. I think we're taking turns. Yeah. You've already rehearsed this. Are we in first? Come down. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Hi. Nice to Hi. see you again. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, good evening. Thanks for having uh, our team here to present uh, Program Studies Updates, um, which is kind of the first chapter in the course selection process, which we'll deal detail a little bit later in this presentation. So before we get into the specific changes, um, just a reminder of how we got here. Um, in 2022, there was a fairly extensive program review in which each department looked at their offerings. Um, and thought about how they might be expanded or updated or um, opportunities to provide more student choice. Um, each department was led by the curriculum team leader or liaison, um, proposed changes, and over the past half year or so, um, went to work on those changes. So what you're gonna hear tonight is where those changes become real in the program of studies and then get put out to students and families to select the courses um, that were implemented as a result. Uh, before we get into the specifics of the departmental changes, I want to give a specific thank you to a couple people who really poured time into this document. Uh, Mr. Miranda is our assistant principal, primarily responsible for scheduling and everything connected to it. Um, Ms. Dickerson is our CTL for school counseling um, and maintains awareness of every department and every course and how it impacts students. Um, and Mrs. Sue Murray is the administrative assistant uh, for the principal's office uh, and maintains this incredible document and all of the changes. Did an incredible job of maintaining all of these changes with a working document and then producing the final document. Um, so thank you to those people specifically. Um, we're going to start um, with the English department. Um, is Parvanian. Harvey I know. Harvey I know. I practice all I day. Know, I know. Too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, English 12 is our big change for the, uh, this department. Right. 
Take it so away. last year in the fall, we conducted our program review. We looked at how other uh, departments in the area, English departments, are running, and we decided that it was time to make some updates to English 12. So for the next school year, seniors will have three different options for English 12. We have English 12 Horror, Mystery, and Crime, English 12 War and Literature, English 12 Shakespeare and Pop Culture. We are also running AP English Language and Composition and AP English Literature and Composition. And just a little asterisk there, AP Language and Composition is open to students both 11 and 12, so those sections are often mixed. Um, and for the English 12 courses, students will be able to take those at either the CP or the honors level. And as we work through this presentation, there'll be uh, a couple other members of our team to come up and talk about their department. Um, and, and so we might pause now, and if there are questions about English 12 or this department, uh, while Mia's here, it would be an opportunity. Perfect. Mr. Turner. A quick one about, first of all, thank you, and I, I appreciate the, the new way of thinking about this. Is, with that many options, is there any risk that some of the sections might not get enough students to fill? Yes, it's, we're probably not going to see all of those permutations run. They're in the program of studies. Students will be signing up for their primary choice of an English 12 course, and then teachers will be helping to make that selection of CP versus honors for the best placement for students. Um, once we get an initial sense of numbers, Students will be meeting individually with their school counselors. If we find that there's low interest in a particular course, students will be asked to pick a second best option, more, most likely. And the second best option might be a different level of that genre, or it might be a different genre. Mrs. Burns. I just have to say, in, in reading the, um, well, literature is, my, is where I, I'm at, the, just the creativity as to combining war and literature, I immediately think of Hemingway, you know, in that realm, but, but just the pop culture and Shakespeare and, and all the, the links, you know, whether it be films or plays, you know, it's just, what a great, a great approach to it in, in a different capacity, which I think is um, identifiable. And, um, uh, you know, they can, students can place themselves in real time. And I just think it's a great approach. And, Kind of, and it, when this comes out, I always I'm like, oh, I would love to take this class, and um, and I think that's what um, that's what I get so excited about in reading the program of studies, all the, the classes I wish I could go back and take, but don't have time to write papers. So, <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Plowman, and then Mr. Smaha. Just to piggyback on um, Ms. Burns, I, you know, one of the outcomes of the this the review was about student engagement. And I think that's really what you're trying to capture here with that. So nice job. Thank you. Um, I mean, very similar comments. I, I won't repeat them. Um, I, I think those look great. I'm curious, though, about how was the decision made for those specifically? Was that, how did that come we, about? It was a very long process. We looked at all the different types of courses that were out there. We looked at some things that we were interested in. We whittled it down to a list of about 10. Last year we conducted focus groups with the students that are currently juniors about to become seniors because it would affect them most. Uh, we had them work both as individuals, getting individual responses without peer pressure or peer response. We had them work in groups as well, collected a lot of data. Uh, those courses that we're running are the ones that were either very popular courses that went well to folks we already have. And so there were some that were you know, clearly duds that weren't necessarily high interest, so we all dropped those immediately. And it is entirely possible we could in the future look at adding additional versions of it, but those, these three seemed like the, uh, the best ones to start with. And can I just, just follow up? So, are, are th so these courses are, um, you know, teacher created, so they're not, they're not following any sort of standardized curriculum, but it's just. They are teacher created. We will be having conversations about how to make sure that the courses are balanced so that it's not the case that one course is wildly difficult compared to the others. I mean, obviously Shakespeare is a bit of a lift. It's 400 year old text, but <laughs> you know, we're trying to make sure that they're comparable in terms of difficulty if they're all CP courses or all honors courses. Thank you. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about the Shakespeare and pop culture? Because it's, it's easy enough to imagine the Shakespeare part. It's like, all right, so we have plays. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course, you can imagine adaptations of the million movies and recorded you know, productions and so forth. Um, what other kinds of media are you thinking that they're going to be reading or consuming as part of this 
We're thinking about looking at anything including themes in the music, themes in uh, visual art. I think a lot of Shakespeare is also looking at um, some of the larger questions that he's answering about humanity. And there are a lot of different ways that we can thematically connect, even if it's not a direct allusion to the play. And so we'll be doing probably a deep dive on that. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Give that a 10 out of 10. All right. It's like you've thought this through or something. <laughs> And this is, of course, why Mia is here to field these questions. <laughs> yeah, she's like, I got that. She's like, give me something I can't. No, I'm kidding. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I think we, we have finished talking about ELA. Are we good? Great. Awesome. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Mathematics. Thank you so much. It was nice to see you. I want to take all three of those. Perfect. Uh, and so I'm pleased to introduce Mary Beth Baluk, Hello. our mathematics curriculum team leader, to talk about um, some of the new courses and uh, adjustments that are happening in the math department. So I'm actually going to work from the bottom up um, on this list, kind of. Um, the first thing that we're removing from the program of studies that I mentioned last year was we are phasing out integrated math two. This year we phased out integrated math one, and we needed to keep two for the students who were already in that program. Um, we're going to have all freshmen enter into algebra one because you know, research shows us they're more successful in their grade level classes and not in a in a separate program that's keeping them um, at a Lower, at lower content level. Um, algebra 3 is being replaced by financial applications of algebra. Um, some of that is going to be, um, you know, real life applications of mathematics that, you know, I see people asking, why don't we talk about our taxes? Why don't we talk about the stock market? That sort of thing. Um, and then where algebra actually plays into real life um, that you might see outside of the school building. Um, and then we have some course additions. Um, the one that I mentioned last year was AP Computer Science A. I don't have enough staffing to run both AP Computer Science principles and A at the same time, so we alternate the years that those are going to be offered. So next year we will be running A. I'm running principles this year. College Board, I'm very excited about this, came out this year with the, they introduced it this year for the start of next year, um, a new AP pre-calculus course. Um, in sitting down and, and going through it, it is supposed to, um, according to the College Board and the readers, um, better prepare students for calculus, um, specifically Calculus BC, which is harder. It's two semesters of college calculus as compared to one. Um, I know BC calculus is something um, that my predecessor looked at trying to get implemented um, in, in our school district for a long time. I think that there's some interest in it. <laughs> um, so we would like, we see the interest in our rising students, um, that there's enough interest to be able to hopefully run BC calculus at one point and we want to put our students who are interested in that, um, you know, in the best situation. Um, and with the success of the implementation of AP um, computer science principles, per Ms. Burns' request last year, we are implementing the CP computer science principles to make computer science more um, reachable for all of our students, not just our top level students. You mentioned to me last year, well, what about CP? We want to make it accessible to everybody. So we've had success this year, and they, awesome. Project Lead the Way has a course um, that is an introductory computer science course. Um, so because of how scheduling works and our freshmen and sophomores, who this might be more, um, attainable for, if you will. Um, the way their scheduling works, they don't necessarily have a full year course available to them in their schedule. So what we did is we took that course and we broke it up into two parts. Um, the first part is kind of a very basic introductory introduction to coding, block-based coding, um, and what is computer science in general. So they can take that as <clears throat> a semester level course. And they could stop there if they want. If they like it, great. If they don't like it, then that's, that's the end of it. Um, then we have Computer Science Essentials 2, which is going to really get into the text-based coding and what you need to be successful in the AP courses later on. Um, Essentials 1 will be required for Essentials 2, and beginning with our current sophomores, we are going to make Computer Science Essentials 1 a prerequisite, prerequisite for the AP level courses um, so that they can be even more successful um, in those AP level courses. Questions? 
Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Mr. Ragsdale. Uh, so I'm just trying to follow what you just said. So you were saying that they have the computer science essentials one. Mm -hmm. Is that a semester long? The, yes, both of those will be semester long. So it's meant to be a full year course. Mm -hmm. um, but our younger students don't necessarily have the room in their schedules for a full year elective with all of the requirements that they need to take for graduation. Um, so students, if they have the room, they could take you know one and then two and essentially take it in one year. Or if a student doesn't have room, they could take one during their freshman year and they could take two during their sophomore year. Um, okay. And but you also suggested that if they don't like it, so if they take one and don't like it, they can stop there. They can stop to... there. They will get they will earn two and a half credits as an elective credit. Um, okay, but they would have to make that I mean they have because they're deciding their courses for the entire year. Correct. And so how do they, I guess it's I guess it's a matter of like you wouldn't take it unless you were really sure you wouldn't want to sign up for both of them in right. the senior so, and we do have students who who know and they want to do it and that's great but we have some students that don't know or you know maybe we have a freshman who's taking managing their money and only has room for another half year course um, so they take that and they say okay I really liked that I can take the second half of my sophomore year. Um, and, and then still be able to get to both AP computer science courses if that's what they desire. Um, okay, so, so if you weren't sure, it would basically take it one semester yep. and then the following year you could continue on. With Correct, you, yes. Uh, if you wanted to. Um, and then for the, so I, for the AP pre-calculus course, mm -hmm. so I'm just thinking about like what the path would be. Is that open to sophomores or is that, do you have to be a junior? Uh, you're gonna have to complete Algebra two to get there. Um, and typically our sophomores, well, it depends on the path in middle school. Mm -hmm. um, I have s primarily sophomores taking Algebra two, um, sophomores and juniors, so it would be open to juniors and seniors. Okay, so the expectation would be that the, you know, if you're an accelerated Algebra one in eighth grade, mm -hmm. then you would still move into Geometry Correct. in ninth grade. Geometry. Algebra two in 10th grade, yes. and then if you wanted to, you would be ready for Yes, and then, so then they have the three options for pre-calculus. They have CP, they have honors, and then they have this new AP course that they okay preparing them for calculus in their senior year correct anything else all right thank you so quick thing, I really appreciate the the expansion of the math program and this direction I think it's mm -hmm. fantastic thanks excited all well, work. Yeah. thank you so much thank you thank, thank you, you. Thanks. thanks thanks shift down <laughs> all right <laughs> We've been practicing this transition. Well rehearsed. <laughs> we, we appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. And so uh, Mr. Miranda and I will be talking about some of the updates for the other departments. Uh, I'll start with social studies. Um, there was a minor start and end date adjustment for global uh, one, two, and three. Um, the updated dates are all in your packet, so I won't read through all of these uh, specific minor updates unless there's questions. Um, the College Board uh, provided new language on the course descriptions for AP US and AP Modern World, so those are reflected. Uh, we noticed that World War II, that we have two courses, World War II Europe, World War II Pacific, each is a semester course, uh, but they had the same course title, uh, course description. So we've re revised that. They now each have uh, their own appropriate course description. Um, and then there were some social studies electives more than other departments that had a teacher rec recommendation requirement. Uh, and so to be consistent with the electives in other departments and to make them more accessible, that teacher recommendation has been removed uh, for that particular department. You want to talk world language? I just brought it. Yeah. So please don't ask me questions about world language. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the, base, the changes that at the Spanish five level and the Italian five level, French five level, they've always tried to separate in the semester courses to make it more available, make, to allow kids more options and just to create more interest. We tend to lose um, interest as the kids move into the upper levels of, of the foreign language. Um, and the world language department really works hard to, to make it accessible. Mm -hmm. So in the past, the second <coughs> half has been called, has been dealt with film, art and culture. Um, which is an overview, it was really nice, but it wasn't really getting them speaking enough. So they've changed the focus now to French in the speaking world, Italian in the speaking world, Spanish in the speaking world. So it really is similar, just it's really pushing the kids toward more conversational work and to try to make it more accessible and, and not as scary 
you know, the kid sits and has to watch a French film or Italian film or understand this culture, that may, maybe it's the language part of it is a little more accessible for them. So that is the gist of what I understood from my discussions with um, our World Language Department. And I think in light no of, of oh, sorry, <laughs> and I think in light of the uh, exchange conversation, like mm -hmm. preparing our Spanish five students to enter the Spanish speaking world, like reflects kind of the maybe even the theme shift mm -hmm. um, in that language. Yeah. Uh, we can pause here for questions on either department. <laughs> uh, I can try. Just quickly, the uh, so the the slide says removed teacher recommendations for elective courses. This is in the social studies slide which you which you discussed is that removing it for all elective yes. courses so it's really just cleaning up the data in the past we've had teachers who teach an elective class and may recommend, recommend a student for hey you might like an art class you might like civil war you might like this so when they get pushed over into the tallies the student really didn't want that course but we force recommendations so when a kid takes a math the next consecutive core content class we take that class, I push it into their requests for scheduling, and then the student meets with their guidance counselor and says, I want the honors, or I don't want the honors, or I want this, or I want that, and they can make the changes, but I automatically populate those for the kids. So the kids will see, and then, so I was, I'll talk about it a little later in more detail, but during the recommendation process, English, math, social studies, science, world language will, will recommend the next course in the series, really for honors or CP level. And then the student will take, say, the student wants doesn't want the honors section and wants the CP section, they can change that with their guidance counselor. If they want the honors over CP, they can fill out the waiver and take the honors section. So we get that adjustment face to face. The elective part of it is their student's choice. Students can take whatever electives they choose. So really to allow them to really take control over the conversation and, and decide what they want. So our numbers are more accurate as far as student interest because we're going to run courses based on student interest hmm. at that particular does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, our business technology uh, listings are um, being modified in part to reflect the changes in the math department. So we were teaching introduction to computer programming in the business department. That's being removed because it's being replaced by the computer essentials one and two, computer science essentials one and two that Ms. Valuk just discussed. Um, and then just a renaming of a course, same curriculum. The Managing Your Money course, which is a graduation requirement that all students take, just changing the title to Personal Finance uh, to more, I think, professionally kind of refer to that curriculum um, and to match uh, how it's referred to um, in other schools and other states. The health and, oh, sorry. Sure. The health and PE uh, department uh, is really excited about this change. Uh, this was pushed um, significantly by the high school teachers and supported, supported by Ms. Stinson, who's the liaison for this department. Currently, this year, Health Dynamics 9 slash 10 is where the 9th and 10th graders in mixed classes get their health and PE. And then in Health Dynamics 11 slash 12 is where uh, the juniors and seniors get their uh, health and PE. So the first change that um, is being proposed is to change the 9 slash 10 to Health Dynamics 9 and Health Dynamics 10. Actually going back, yeah. Yeah, so that was a temporary change that happened to explore this um, and, and create more flexibility with scheduling, but the health and PE teachers really feel like they can provide more appropriate and targeted instruction to ninth graders mm -hmm. in Health Dynamics 9 better for 10th graders in Health Dynamics 10. Mm -hmm. For 11 and 12, so in 9 and 10, they'll get kind of their general introduction to fit principles of exercise, physical education, um, and they advocated strongly to provide students with the choice to pick um, kind of the domain of physical exercise that they're most comfortable or interested in. Um, and so team sports, net sports, conditioning, group fitness, unified physical education, mindfulness, recreational games, those are all gonna be electives and the student will pick um, the type of physical activity that they want to participate in. Um, the one that I think is not self-evident is unified physical education. Um, that's a course um, that will um, incorporate both students with individualized education plans and general education students all in one place. Um, it's in alignment with like unified uh, athletics and activities that um, schools are developing and Mr. Ingram is exploring for the high school. This would be an opportunity to not do it in a club sense, but in our uh, actual academic programming. 
uh, and we can pause for questions on those too. Yes. Um, on oh, the sorry. <laughs> it's all right, Mr. Gender. Um, <laughs> I don't understand how the Roberts rules work. However, Mr. Samaha does understand. <laughs> sure. Mr. Samaha. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, the team sports, and that's where all of those different options, those are year long courses or they are semester based. Those are semester based yeah. courses. And is mindfulness one thing by itself, or is it mindfulness and recreational? Yeah. Those are separate those are, courses. Those are separate courses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Comment, please. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I'm the English teacher, just for the record. <laughs> um, I, would, I would love to see the health and PE department expand our mental health awareness um, courses mm -hmm. beyond just mindfulness. I think that it, it um, would coincide with the data that our district is showing and the state is showing around anxiety and depression rates and I think there's a lot more that we can do to teach kids than just mindfulness because in my work kids don't do that very readily or well and there are so many coping skills and ways that we can support kids um, so I'd love to see that department just think about that a little bit more and perhaps expand in that area for the future. Sure, that's great feedback. Thank you. Mr. Turner? And actually, following on that, I actually was hoping that what the comma was intentionally left out there, because in, <laughs> in some ways, the, 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 the mental health part of it and the physical health part of it, linking them together as, as a course would be one way to address it, because there is a lot of evidence that physical, physical activity does benefit mental health and teaching you know, students how if you do these things, it will help in these other ways, and linking them together could be a good expansion on, on what Ms. Plowman said as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, these distinctions, I think, weren't um, necessarily an exhaustive list. I think they were taking what they currently teach in health dynamics and kind of naming the different things. So with this feedback, um, you know, it's certainly possible as they repackage to grow in specific places. So that's mm -hmm. helpful. Thanks. Uh, performing in visual arts, um, so the course Popular Music was unfortunately not terribly popular in terms of enrollments. Um, the Performing and Visual Arts Department attributed that to a similar course, American Music, which is very popular. And so they felt due to that overlap, taking this one away and replacing it with a separate course, Intro to Songwriting, a course where students learn how to express themselves in songwriting and create their own music uh, was an appropriate shift. Uh, the visual arts department is really just repackaging graphic design one and two into digital media. Digital media is a broader bucket of um, work that students will do. It'll take graphic design courses and an animation courses and create a broader uh, domain for digital media. And just a titling thing with the advanced portfolio naming which type of advanced portfolio it is. Um, in the packet, I under additional changes, it says removed, undersubscribed, and inactive courses. That was actually something that didn't go into this program of studies. We have a number of courses that every year don't get enough tallies to run um, because two or three students sign up for them. Uh, over the last number of years, there are some courses that every year end up in that status. Uh, and there were conversations earlier in this process about taking them out. Um, that didn't go into the final version, so in your packet of all the course descriptions, no courses are removed other than the senior internship seminar. That was a course that was not developed or implemented, uh, and so therefore students um, didn't have the opportunity to sign up, uh, and because it's not an existing course ready to go, it won't be in um, this current program of studies. Uh, last, the career clusters. Um, so uh, the career clusters are updated thanks to Christine Elliott, who's not here, but was kind of the Canva expert in editing the career clusters in a different uh, program. Uh, but to talk a little bit about career clusters, Ms. Dickerson. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, so I just want to give a little bit of background on where this came from. It sort of appeared for you last year. Yep. Oh. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about where it came from and how we're using it. So very brief history lesson of 
career clusters. So in 1996, there was a federal initiative for a standardized language about career exploration and kind of preparing students for the American workforce. So there was a collaboration between all these different departments and the federal government that came up with these with 16 career clusters, and those are kind of the industry standards. So anytime you're looking at career clusters or career inventories or exploration, almost always you come back to the 16 clusters that exist. So each cluster comes with uh, sort of packaged with knowledge and skills that students need to be successful in that cluster. That comes from the Department of Labor. So they do their own survey data about people who are in those fields, what knowledge and skills they have, and what they can recommend for students who are preparing to enter that field. And then it also comes with career uh, coursework pathways. So suggested coursework for the secondary level and the post-secondary level of what students would need to be successful in that field. So we have all that data, the counselors reviewed all that data. We condensed that information into the five career clusters that you see in the program of studies and then mapped it to courses that are specific to Wilmington High School. So each cluster that has those suggested pathways of coursework, we were able to then pull out what specific courses match those pathways in Wilmington so that students can see specifically what courses are available here that would prepare them for each cluster. And then counselors used uh, the extracurricular opportunities and mapped them in the same way so that students could see what extracurricular opportunities we have that are matched to each cluster. So uh, that's how they came about and then how we use them. So our counselors meet with students in every grade level each year. We meet with our 10th graders about four times in the 10th grade, we focus on career exploration. So at the end of February, we'll meet with those students. They do a career interest inventory. It pops out their top clusters. And then we walk them through the knowledge and skills that are necessary for success in that field and then the coursework. So that will be done at the end of February with the goal of using that information in their course selection. So each counselor meets with every student individually. We're really proud of that process. So we take time to meet with our own students and talk to them about their planning and their coursework. So a counselor can sit down with a student and say, you know, do you remember your career interest inventory? What were your clusters? Let's look at this list of courses at the high school that might match the cluster that you're interested in um, and make sure that we're planning courses that are um, sort of intentional with the goal of preparing them for whatever they want to do after. And that's kind of how they came about and how we use them. Mrs. Burns. I think they're an, a fabulous addition to the, the program of study. I think it's, a, a, it's, a, it's almost a, a pathway mm -hmm. uh, of sorts to just review and, uh, you know, kids can, to, there's a variety of ways as to how you can look at it. What courses I like to take and where does that align me? I, I, I really was very, um, very kind of excited to see that. I always like pathways for myself. <laughs> Um, but could, I had one point of a question that I wanted to get some clarification on regarding the senior internship seminar. Is that, that's not removing the program where seniors, if, if they go, it does, okay. Because I thought that was, was it not a part so of it or was it supposed to be? A, we had a, years ago we had an idea to <coughs> kind of take the, the second semester for seniors and give them an opportunity to be in a, in a seminar just to kind of help prepare them for choosing their internships. And since we've, accom we've accomplished that task through group meetings and individual meetings and the, and the application process, so it just never really took, came to fruition. We, we didn't have the staff to teach it. We didn't really have a plan for it. It was, just, it was an idea that, that we came up with as a team prior to, to, um, to Mr. Gendron. Right, coming and in. A way to try to support whole, whole class involvement. And the whole class involvement came more readily than, than I guess we thought. So am, am I mistaken that, um, I, I'm trying to recall if that seminar was supposed to be utilized in um, a different capacity um, for those not either not participating in internships, but in a, a different way of showing portfolios or? It was really to support and get it, get it to become, get full participation. Okay, so the, very good. The idea is, we're, we're now at 100% participation, so every senior, and there are special circumstances maybe right. a kid would, or a student wouldn't participate, but we're already we're at 
Very good. Okay. And just in case there's anyone listening at home, so that program you're referring to is the Senior Exploration Program. Right. Four weeks during quarter four where seniors go out and do their internship or, pro or project. No changes to that. Okay. This was almost like a proceeding course to set that up that didn't come to fruition, gotcha. but no changes to Senior Exploration. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Yep. Other questions or comments? I just think this is fantastic as a way to help provide students with guidance as to, to logical choices. And, and obviously, they may move from year to year as to where, where their interests lay, but it, it's a really helpful tool for, for students and parents. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mrs. Palmer. Um, I really like that you have attached the clubs and organizations aspect too, just as sort of a mm -hmm. sort of reminding students all the time of other ways to, you know, connect with other kids who are like-minded um, and do things outside of the classroom that might be related to that career path too. Oh, sorry. Just one added, one added piece is that I think what the, these career clusters show is that we know that kids learn in, in diverse ways. And I think it was, I think that may be what I was trying to get at, that when you look at these clusters, you don't have to necessarily start with the career opportunities or the, or the courses. It may start off in the clubs and organizations first and then spread out. And I think for those diverse learners that, that learn and uh, benefit in, in you know, multiple different ways, I, I love that, act, that ability to have access, a variety of access points for, for kids to um, figure it out. And uh, these have been presented at both the eighth grade kind of targeted good, events good, and good. the ninth grade orientation. And the feedback from those families has been like really strong awesome. um, because they know their student and this gives them a tangible way to see what, what their high school experience is going to look like in terms of courses and clubs. So, um, you know, thanks to everyone who put all the work into making this such a concise document. This is um, can you expand on that a little bit, what you were just saying about um, like rising like eighth graders and how do we really promote this because not a lot of people are sitting and probably watching this meeting and <coughs> I get really excited when I hear about all these great changes that are happening and all the opportunities for kids coming up into the high school but how can we improve our way of sort of communicating this out to you know kids that are in sixth seventh grade as well I'm just trying to trying to you know yeah it's a great question um, that uh, dr. quirk and I have discussed quite a bit and it felt kind of like chapter one was getting all the eighth graders up here for the day at the <coughs> high school time in the auditorium and this was one of our slides you know we don't have time to tell you about all of our courses but here's how we group them yeah. you're gonna like one of these clusters and if you do here are courses you'll love here's clubs you can get involved in it's just kind of the quick Mm -hmm. on, on the eighth graders with the seventh and sixth graders uh, we've talked about spring programming maybe a replica of like a day at the high school mm -hmm. uh, and so that feels like chapter two for dr. quirk and I to figure mm -hmm. out um, kind of what comes next yeah that's great mm -hmm. I'll say on that note um, even with the eighth grade student I think so they may be seeing this but I'm not sure the families are necessarily mm -hmm. seeing it and I love this idea because I do think it gives us sort of this tangible like let's talk about this together and let's, I'm not gonna put you in this bucket, but, cause I know you have interests here and here and here, but look at all these things that, I think that might be a helpful thing to send out in some way, or maybe it has gone out, I don't know, but I haven't, hasn't come across, it's come across here in school committee, but I haven't seen it as a caregiver. So I'm just wondering if there's a way that we can sort of socialize that a bit, because I do think it's a really interesting thing that Yeah, we got similar feedback from the School Advisory Council as we were talking about handbook policies and that being a dense document, the program of studies being a dense document, and finding some kind of way to real concisely onboard people with the most important right now information has emerged as a theme, so I think I'm hearing that from both groups. Mr. Um, I, I think that that point is actually really important because the families are going to have much more interest in this and be much more connected to it <laughs> than the certainly than sixth and seventh graders. Like you know, hopefully, I mean, I hope they're not thinking really about careers. Um, you know, they have enough to on their plates and just getting through sixth and seventh grade. Um, but the, but this is something that it is really good for families to be aware of is coming down the road because again, even if they don't feel that they need to push their sixth graders into a career at this point, um, 
uh, it's good for them to understand that this information is, is going to be there and that there, there's going to be guidance waiting for them when it is time. Yeah, and just to elaborate on that comment um, uh, of the response to this, it has been the adults. So we had like all the eighth grade parents at a separate event. Um, and that's when this was presented and I kind of got that feedback. Similarly, with the rising ninth graders in the late summer, they have a day where the parents and the kids come. And that's when that uh, kind of feedback came. Uh, but the points about making this accessible to all families uh, is definitely received. Mm -hmm. And this may not, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on, I promise. This may not have to do exactly with this, but as students are, are trying to find their, kind of their niche or their nook, I, I guess I wonder what sort of work is done around helping them make, make choices, right? There's so much that's offered, um, but there are so, there's so much they can't actually do. And I, if, if they're involved in athletics, they're involved in a club that takes a lot of time, there are so many things they have to say no to. And so as a, as a parent of a, of a student who's entering high school, I have a different, I'm like, ooh, the whole world, but then you actually have a kid in high school, and you're like, ooh, wow, it's really tricky to fit everything in, because you actually, why are you taking that class? She's like, I can't take that class. I have to take this class and this class. And, that, mm -hmm. and so it is tricky. I just wonder what sort of like advice, not necessarily advising, but just sort of talking to our high schoolers about, you are gonna have to make choices, and if you are doing sports every season, that means you're not going to be able to do this and this, and those are decisions you have to make. Because I think that's part of the, the growing maturity process is having to say mm -hmm. no to certain things because you might want something a little bit more. And that's so I'm just curious to know what sort of work is done around the sort of the decision making um, for kids when they when they come into the high school and then as they go through their years here. Do school do the seminars touch on that? Yes, so our ninth grade seminars, the first one we do is talking about the opportunities available and helping kids kind of think about what they want to be involved in. Um, and with that, I think, comes, like, we usually have them look at, are, are you in athletics? What clubs might you be interested in? And they, I think, start to see, especially once they've done one season, unfortunately, athletics does kind of curtail some of the other things because they're happening at the same time. Um, so I think they see it pretty quickly in terms of time, um, but we do go over like what opportunities are available and how to choose. So for example, for not that we don't want them to be involved in everything, but for colleges, like to look at what are you most passionate about? What can you give your m the most time to? What can you be the most invested in? That's where we encourage them to choose and spend their time. Um, because it really gives them a chance to grow over the four years and then shine when they apply to school and can say that they've been invested in something for that long. But it is, I mean, they do have to choose. They, you know, you can't, be, you can't be deeply invested in seven or eight or nine different things. Um, so that's kind of how we frame the conversation is just thinking about, you know, where can you make the most impact? Where do you feel the most passionate? And then focus on those few things. And I think one other place that it is tangentially related is through our advisory curriculum. At the beginning, midpoint, and end of the year, we do goal setting. Uh, and it's not as directly linked to like evaluating the groups that you're related to, but it is carved out time to try to facilitate some reflection from students uh, to think about what they are doing and what they want to be doing. And maybe this is an opportunity to integrate the career clusters with that reflection and maybe uh, open some new doors or... Uh, refocus time. Thank you so much. This is really helpful, and we love to hear about all the changes. So thank you. <coughs> and um, are we good? Are you good? Yeah. All right. I see one more thing here, but you don't. The last thing is the course selection next steps. Um, do you want to just give a quick overview, just so you know where we're at? Mm -hmm. um, speaking about what we spoke a little bit earlier is um, <clears throat> we'll have class meeting between the grades. And just, just, just on the record earlier, without Miss Dickerson, my job is impossible. So. <laughs> She's, she's really a rock star, just so you all know. Um, she, has, she has an understanding of every aspect of it, and it's, 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 it's really nice for me. Um, so they'll meet with class meetings, guides will speak with them, we'll speak with them. We're talking about teacher recommendations right now, so um, <clears throat> by February 10th, teachers will make their recommendations for core classes. Uh, math, English, social studies, science, fourth language, <clears throat> really pretty much honors or AP. English teachers have a little bit of extra work this year, but they're gonna speak with each kid about what that student would like to take as far as one of those three op options. Um, and then that student will pick their first option, then two alternates, so we kind of know where we're going in that respect. 
Um, prior after recommendations, students have their time to make requests in Aspen, and that's the time we hope the student goes through and looks at what they want to do, and after me, you know, talks with mom and dad and family. Really, you know, in my home, my home, I have, I have a high school freshman and a, and a college freshman in my home. Picking courses is a family endeavor. Um, <clears throat> my poor kids, but um, you know. The, the, the conversation really is about the family sitting down and looking at this together. So the student will pick in Aspen their courses and then hopefully sit down with mom and dad, caregiver, guardian, and say, you know, this is what I'm interested in, have a discussion. Um, caregiver, guardian, mom and dad will then go into Aspen at a different time and press a button that says, yep, I read this and I approve this and I know what my child is taking. Um, and hopefully that conversation at home is authentic so when they check that button, they actually know that. Um, then the councils meet with every single student, one-on-one, -on -one, and look at it together. And does this make sense? Do you have this requirement? Is this a good choice for you? You know, do you want to take seven AP courses? Um, really, that's <laughs> probably the most important part of the whole conversation is for the student to sit. You know, some of our students won't take the time to make those selections. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll pick random classes to get it done, and then we do kind of channel them into to the guidance office, to the counseling office, I'm sorry, the school counseling office to really make those decisions and have those conversations, um, tough conversations. And teachers in the recommendation time will have tough conversations with students about, you know, <clears throat> honors may not be for you, AP may be for you or not for you, C belonging to CP. So, you know, <clears throat> there is some guy, there's really a lot of guidance in this process. There's a, there's a group, there's individual, there's, they can they set up meetings with, with admin. It's really, it's a good process. We do, I think we do a nice job at, at the moment with this whole process. Um, and then ultimately, if things go to plan, we'll come up with the number of sections we need, um, see what courses are actually going to physically run. And April vacation, I'll be in that office hopefully putting together some actual working scenarios. <laughs> and we'll be good. But Excellent. it's an exciting time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We thank you for your effort and for taking such good care of our kids. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. All right. Excellent. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Guys. Much appreciated. We are going to um, skip over item C and we're going to move right to number seven public comment. Mr. Ragsdale. Uh, <clears throat> we had no one sign up to deliver a public comment, um, but the committee did receive four written comments that uh, have been distributed and that we have all read. Uh, is there anyone present who would like to make a public comment? No one. We we're ready to move on. Okay, sounds good. Are you changing seats? I'm like, is Glenn yeah. making, a Glenn public making a public comment? He's making a public comment. Can you sit there? Because I could actually, you know, get us right in there. I was going to be like, wait a minute. I just got so confused. <laughs> We were faster than they thought. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, this evening, uh, very briefly to provide a recap, really, uh, since uh, at the last meeting we had the opportunity <coughs> to provide the committee with an update on what is emerging as the recommended budget. Uh, we are exactly at the point in time in which we, we typically are. We are also, I'll just point out, uh, just ahead of the town manager's budget presentation that is scheduled for next Monday evening at 7 o'clock with the Board of Selectmen. Uh, uh, and so, again, really just a recap, nothing has changed since the last meeting that we had here together a week ago, uh, but uh, uh, for everyone's, uh, everyone's benefit, just to sort of circle back to where we are at right now. Um, we presented to you, of course, as a committee back in December, what was the uh, preliminary budget at that point in time. Uh, following that presentation, we then met, as you know, with Mr. Hall, town manager, uh, for specifically the purposes of understanding what he felt as the town manager that the departments and, and the school department uh, that he could support. He asked us to, uh, to uh, try and align our overall budget increase for the school department to 3.75%. You may recall that as part of the preliminary budget, we were just under 5%. Uh, that again, um, looking backwards, was uh, late December, right before the winter break. Since that point in time, the uh, Central Office Administration has looked to review the overall budget requests. We had a target of that $565,000, which is the delta or the gap between the 3.75% and the 4.98% uh, that we were at with the preliminary budget. Um, following 
uh, slides reflect really the highlights that we, uh, we, we did administratively to try and make those adjustments to the overall budget. These are the slides that um, Paul and, and his office work uh, uh, very hard to pull together. I do want to give a shout out to Lauren, who's here with us tonight from Paul's office. She was here last time. There's an awful lot of work, of course, that goes into rolling up all these numbers. It looks super simple on a couple of slides, but of course it is not. And there's an awful lot of detail behind this. This uh, shows you um, the personnel changes. Uh, there is a lot of parts to this, and certainly Paul can, can add in if I miss anything. But again, the acronym that we use an awful lot, the FTEs is the full-time equivalency. So when you roll together everyone that is in our organization right now in the current fiscal year 23 budget, we are just shy of 490 FTE equivalents. Those changes that uh, are highlighted there at the, uh, at the very top of the page, those were prior to the start of the fiscal year of this fiscal year. Those were changes that happened after uh, the budget had, um, had been finalized. And they are, uh, they are reflected or tied specifically to special education programming. More specifically, uh, the need to bring online at the Boutwell uh, a, um, a special education program. The students were uh, sort of now on our doorstep, literally following the finalization of the budget. We had no choice. We had to create that program in order to, to best accommodate and meet those needs of the students. It happens from some time to time. It doesn't happen necessarily every year, but it does happen from time to time. Going into this year was an example. So that adjustment there is the 2.0 FTEs. At the start of the school year, as a result, we were 491.45 FTEs. And then uh, below that, you can see the changes. We've talked about this in the past, specifically through the preliminary budget, um, that we are looking, uh, we have been looking very closely at to make adjustments. Uh, there is uh, both uh, reductions that, is, is, uh, that are planned, that are in this budget plan before you, um, and there are also additions, of which we've talked um, at some length about in the interest of time. I won't go into those, uh, but they're captured there. So the preliminary budget as it stands before you tonight uh, includes 493.75 FTEs. So there is a slight uh, increase from our current uh, place that we stand right now, um, but that is accounted for by both the reductions as well as the additions. Salary changes are captured on the next, oh, did, did I miss something? Sorry, Paul. If I may. The 493.75 FTE that the superintendent just mentioned, um, that was in our preliminary budget. Yep. And we had to make some additional reductions in order to get to the um, 3.75 increase. So you see that on the slide, uh, the previous slide, where it had uh, <coughs> additional enrollment reductions of 4.4 um, to get us to the recommended budget of 489.35 FTEs. Thank you. The next slide uh, shows the salary changes, obviously all at a very, very high level, but this is how it all rolls up together. The overall salaries that were included in the fiscal year 23 budget of this year, you'll note there, uh, just a little bit over $36 million. Uh, the breakdown of that respectively uh, in terms of uh, moving forward into the fiscal year 24 budget plan is captured in the lines below. Uh, a lot of these terms I know are, are fairly familiar to members of the committee. Um, this really serves as the basis for establishing how much we believe in our budget we need in order to support the people uh, that we believe are necessary to deliver our programs and services. Steps and lanes are identified there, just over uh, $516,000. Um, I know I'm supposed to read. Do you get an update when I don't read every number? No, no. Should? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, $516,000 for steps and lanes. Uh, new positions captured collectively at uh, $659,000, just under $660,000. Salary increases, also part of the overall formula you can see there, uh, just over $991,000. Replacements and reductions. Uh, Paul and his office worked very hard to chart the course in terms of looking at reductions that we're making, also possible replacements through retirements. We are anticipating, again, going into next year, not as many retirements as we've seen in some of the recent past years. Um, that has an impact overall in the, the respective financial planning, but again, uh, through the work of the finance planning office, this is where we have in longevity, a smaller number, but certainly part of the overall uh, salaries that we track. So you can see right now how that rolls up to the fiscal year 24 preliminary budget, $37,959,091. 
percentage change overall, again, we're still sticking with salaries here at 4.33%. Um, anything that I missed there, Paul, you want to expand yes, upon? So the below that where it says the FY24 budget changes uh, and salary increases and replacements and reductions, those are the changes we made um, subsequent to the preliminary budget to, to, once again to get us to the 3.75 total. So uh, the changes we made of that 565,000, if you will, that, that the superintendent mentioned, about 330,000 is related to salary um, and mainly it's the, the reduction in FTEs and so forth. So that gets us to a $37.6 million uh, recommended budget for salary or a 3.43% increase. Non-salary changes, um, a lot of items listed here, but really for the purposes of providing uh, or drawing your attention uh, to uh, the various aspects that are making up this budget line. Of course, as a people business, the, the vast majority of our salaries, or the vast majority of this budget, obviously, is it's associated with salaries. But it's also certainly worthy to note that there are a number of things that as a school district we are uh, obligated to pay for. Many of these we've covered in the past, but special education tuitions, obviously that is a very big number that represents the increase from the current year. We've talked about this at length, but um, that's captured there. And many of the other, uh, many of the other um, uh, subject line, or sorry, uh, categories, budget categories here um, that uh, reflect um, changes from uh, fiscal year 23 into fiscal year 24. Collectively, that rolls up to a percentage uh, change of 7.45% higher than recent years, again, largely driven by special education tuitions, uh, transportation um, predominantly there uh, are captured there, um, and then overall the percentage change that you can see where that rolls up 4.98%. Uh, Anything you want to Yeah, respond? just to draw your attention, the FY24 budget changes, uh, transportation is a reduction of about well, $22,000. Uh, That's um, if you remember, in our transportation, preliminary budget, we assumed a 10% increase in transportation. Um, we had a, a bid opening and so forth, and it was around 8% increase, so there's a little bit of savings there. Um, curriculum and curriculum supplies, we reduced that 15,000. Professional development, 10,000. Uh, superintendent mentioned that in our last meeting that had to do with kind of strategic plan related uh, expenditures that we thought we'd make a reduction <coughs> in. And as we mentioned in the last meeting, a circuit breaker, a special education circuit breaker offset, we've increased by about 188,000. Uh, collectively, that uh, totals 235, $236,000. That makes up the rest of that 565,000 that we had to cut to get to a 3.75% uh, increase. You want to follow that? Mm -hmm. So this slide uh, attempts to try and just show how this all weaves itself together specifically to the salary line as well as the non-salary lines. The comparison you can see there uh, under fiscal year 23 budget, uh, the respective dollar amounts for each of those and then the total you can see down the bottom, 45935465 Alongside of that is the fiscal year 24 preliminary budget, again as, as is before you this evening. You can see the adjustments that we talked a little bit about there, uh, respectively for both salary as well as non-salary. And then finally, on the far right side of the screen, the overall change, both as dollar amount and then percentage for each of those uh, categories, salary and non-salary. So the bottom right number, 3.75, <laughs> obviously ties into what uh, uh, the school department has been uh, asked, uh, if possible, to deliver as an overall budgetary increase from fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 24. Uh, the, uh, the next slide uh, provides a, just a, a recap on, on capital and um, specifically uh, the Wildwood. Um, and uh, it, it, if I may, should I use this sure. as a jumping off point yeah, that's right great. now? Yeah. Um, this sort of dovetails into, it does dovetail into item 8B, the MSBA and Wildwood updates. Um, and uh, uh, good news on this front to be able to share with the committee and the community. Uh, Dr. Bryce and I had the opportunity to meet um, earlier today with um, uh, Mr. Hall, uh, just actually before our meetings today. Um, and uh, we had uh, a really uh, a productive conversation with um, both he and, and Ms. O'Connell, uh, Chair of Board of Selectmen. Um, and uh, uh, we, we've left um, 
we left that meeting with the understanding that Mr. Hull is going to move forward and return uh, to the to his uh, operating budget request uh, the funding of this project for the Wildwood. Um, we uh, we you know certainly Dr. Bryson can can add into the conversation, but again I think it was a it was a really productive conversation. I think that there is the clarity around the challenges that we're facing with the, you know this overall interim solution. I will say that we. Um, we, my team will continue to explore where it is and how it is that we might make, be able to make adjustments to that overall plan. It's understood that this is a, this is a huge dollar amount for, uh, for, for the town to, to, to tackle. Uh, we also though are on this course to try and commit to making this interim solution for the Wildwood possible uh, to support the needs of our students there. Uh, as you know, my feeling on this way, I think that this is the best plan that we have before us um, and so work will continue here, but I think we're, we're in a far better place than um, perhaps we thought uh, a short time ago. Do you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, just that I appreciate their time, and I thought it was a really collaborative meeting, um, and we're able to hear <coughs> sort of all sides of, you know, of that. I think um, Mr. Hall um, and, and Judy O'Connell have, have always, and the Board of Selectmen have always been supportive of our schools, and they've I mean, many things along the way, you know, where we've said we need this and, and we get what we need. And, and I think that it was just a time to say, okay, we hear you, we hear the dismantling of this is problematic. So let's maybe go back and, and just start to think through, maybe we didn't think about another piece that might work here that would also be sufficient. You know, so I think there's just, just a collaborative piece to really figuring out. Um, Mr. Hall is deeply invested in this project and I mean had the maps of everything knows the building in and out is really trying to work closely um, with us to try and find what I would say is going to create a safe and supportive environment for our students and staff for the next for the next five to six years so I feel like we're in a really good place and I think that now it's going to really come to the to the leaders of this project to sort of sit down and say okay wait what does this look like next what are the design specs going to be um, but I feel like we're in, in a good place to move forward and so, um, as always, I think, you know, we, we work well together, so I think it's going to be, it's going to be just fine. So, so I'll just thank them and, and everyone else for being so patient and for so eloquently stating your concerns um, over the last couple of meetings. So, thank you. I'm so happy to, to yeah, hear it's that. Great. Yeah, it's great news. It really yeah. is. Thank you for the effort. So, it's thank good you. news. Um, yeah. Next slide is capital, and um, we you'll see here so the line that says high school projectors well there's notes in the far right column so we moved a hundred thousand dollars from FY 24 to 25 for high school projectors and we moved ninety thousand uh, from FY 24 to 25 for the high school wireless upgrade um, we did this after consultation with um, Ken Ward our director of technology and digital learning uh, he's comfortable with this move and the very last line you see, we added the 1.1 million for the the Wildwood in the capital budget. Um, so, um, in the 20, FY 26, 27, and 28 is exactly the same as what we what you saw in the preliminary budget. Mr. Fallon. Paul, just on that note, the <coughs> 190 was moved to 25 to get to 3.75. I thought capital was. Unrelated. No, it, it, it this is in the capital budget, so it's not in our operating budget. Right. So, but the town has to look collectively at all spending. Sure. So one of the things that <coughs> is if, if there was anything on capital, if we could defer, if you will. Okay. And uh, working with our, uh, Mr. Ken, Ward, yeah, we were comfortable moving that over about one year. That makes more sense. Thank you. And then just finally, a uh, recap of wh what's next, uh, what lies ahead. As mentioned at the outset on January 30th, Monday, um, the town manager is presenting his budget to the Board of Selectmen uh, to the extent that um, members of this committee can be in attendance. It's, um, uh, it's our understanding that that has been customary, um, if you will, in the past. February 15th, we are scheduled to have the uh, budget hearing. Um, this is in accordance with uh, our obligation, your obligation as a school committee on, under... Uh, I guess Mass General Law, arguably. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will post that um, a little bit differently. We'll bring more attention to that um, as we, we do in the past, but that, that's our, our plan right now, uh, February 15th, to be uh, here uh, for that hearing. So uh, and it was rather brief, but all of that said, certainly happy to take any questions if members of the committee have on any of that. Questions, comments? 
Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you again for the, the level of detail at each of these steps. As a newer member of the committee, I really appreciate the thoroughness and the, the, the ability to trace through how the thought process. So thank you. All, all. Well, thank you for that. Mr. Fennelly. For the town manager's budget presentation Monday, is that at town hall? It mm -hmm. is. Do we know? Okay. It is. Seven o'clock. Seven. Yes. Seven. Seven. Thank you. Yep. I thought so. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Turner, for those comments. I'll just say, you know, again, to this, you know, part of this, <clears throat> it's not lost upon us that this, the budget approval is obviously one of your primary responsibilities. Um, sometimes it's difficult to know exactly how much information is helpful for you as a committee to understand, you know, pretty big and complex budget to the degree that there's um, uh, avenues or, or areas or angles, if you will, that you think would be helpful as we continue to move forward in this process. Uh, it's important that you let us know. So we don't, we don't want to overwhelm you with numbers and not have meeting. Uh, it's necessary and important for you to understand it so you can feel confident in a place when it comes time to your ultimate vote to approve it. Thank you, though. Yeah. Actually, to that point, going back a step, one of your earlier slides was the, the kind of the 10-year view of staffing. And for this group, and it, and it talked about the different levels for, for particularly special education. Oh, yes, yes. I think for this group and also very much for the Finance Committee in yes. the wider town, maintaining that slide and rolling it forward each year mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future, I think is super valuable yep. to the questions about enrollment in our overall budget. I appreciate that reminder. And we, when we get to that point of presenting that information, which uh, we do have a date for that, I forget, it's in later February. I think right, maybe, <coughs> season, I think right now, February 28th. February 28th. I, I believe uh, for the Finance Committee meeting with the, with the school with the school committee on the school committee's budget. But once we have the, the definite date, I believe it's February 28th. But I, I will certainly go through and highlight uh, what we think are, and that's a great slide, I think, in here. I agree with you that information, I think, is important for the community to be aware. Mrs. Palmer. Um I, I really appreciate um, the, the care that Dr. Brand and Paul and Christine and your teams have done around prioritizing the different needs. There's so many competing things, and I feel like you've done a nice job capturing what the priorities are, um, you know, including this, the staffing changes and being able to reflect that, that match enrollment, but that also match the needs of our, our growing special education population. Um, and, you know, the challenges I know that must present to you as your team talking about where can, you know, where do we have to cut, what needs to go, and, um, and I really appreciate how you've presented that as well. I'm thoroughly impressed that you've been able to do that um, to get us at the 3.75 mark. Um, and um, is, there, is there any concern that that percentage could shift again between now and April? That's a great question, one that we don't know the answer to. Uh, you know, we're hopeful that um, uh, the perspective, I guess that I'll say that the town manager has in terms of what he believes the capacity is, uh, holds, if you will. I'm not sure if that's the best way to say it, but uh, I think that we, um, if that were to shift, if that were to be, uh, if there was to be more pressure put on departments at large or perhaps ours, I think that this puts us into a very different place. Uh, we, we certainly um, have highlighted the fact that we are making these changes, making this possible through ad uh, 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 adjustments to our staffing. I'll say again, I think it's adjustments that we can be making connected to enrollment and other. But as we've also talked about, we, we're, we're getting there by uh, making adjustments to circuit breaker, fund circuit breaker funding, and that's, um, <coughs> you know, that's a place that uh, is stretching us a little thin in some respects. So I think we're there. If, if, if this number is pushed downwards, I think we have a very different conversation mm -hmm. in terms of the impact and what might be necessary to get there. But let's, let's hope that this can prevail and, and stay where it is. I just Jordan, one last thing. I, I do want to just also extend my gratitude um, to uh, Mr. Hall and Ms. O'Connell and to both of you for um, clearly a really productive, collaborative conversation that you had today. Um, and 
I'm, I'm, you know, I'm proud to, to be on a committee and to work alongside other committees in this town where we can um, express our differences and advocate in our own ways and maintain a level of professionalism um, that I think Wilmington um, can model that kind of leadership for other towns around us. So, um, you know, kudos to everybody and thank you to everybody um, who is at that table and have had those conversations um, behind the scenes. So, great work. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, that brings us to, so we can go right to C, right, which is our school start time. Okay. Um, so item C, we have school start time, uh, finalized decision, and vote. So I'm gonna, I guess I'll pass this to you to just get us started. Sure. Well, there's an, uh, certainly an awful lot of information that uh, you have come, have had come before you as a school committee in the packet. Um, uh, there are a number of pieces that are, that are in there and, and an awful lot to consider. Um, I'll certainly, uh, I think, start by, by saying that uh, this community, I think, should also be uh, thankful for uh, you as a committee for your commitment to hear and be open to hear feedback from uh, both staff as well as both the community. This is, sure, this has been a uh, topic of conversation that has extended out for a long, lengthier period of time. We know, we know the reasons driving behind that, but, uh, but what certainly is the case and what has been uh, somewhat uh, troublesome for me to hear at times is the, that perhaps uh, you as a committee or us as the administration are not open to hearing feedback. I would strongly suggest that that has not been the case and arguably this topic more than any other, uh, I think, uh, in recent m memory for me uh, is one that you as a committee have been committed to hearing feedback on. And for any members of the community who are interested in seeing that feedback, we've tried to make that as transparent as possible including in the school committee packet, all of the written feedback, not only through public comment, but also specifically on this topic in which we've created many opportunities for um, members of the community and staff as well to provide their feedback on that. Um, this, uh, and thank you for the suggestion that I, I know a couple of members of this committee had um, uh, on trying to create something that uh, can provide sort of visually a compare and contrast of where, where, where we were at. As you know, uh, through the, the, the work that uh, has gone on since we, we last met here in this room back in the spring, um, thank you to Mr. Turner, who's been a part of that, Mr. Ruggiero, Mr. Fretter, of course, who's been a, a, a centerpiece for this work. What we brought forward to you is what we feel is the best um, option or best model that we can given the constraints that we have to work with. And um, and that model uh, is, is shown here on this slide. Um, I wish there were more. I wish it were, uh, I wish it were uh, more perfect, if you will, in terms of trying to uh, realize some of the goals. But as we've talked about at length, we have a number of constraints right now that I think make that just not possible. This slide tries to provide you with, uh, again, that comparison for what is right now, our current schedule. Um, and uh, and, and similarly, what this new proposed schedule will be uh, if we were to move forward with it. And then down the, uh, down the bottom is a recap or highlight of the most prominent uh, top priorities that emerged from the vast amount of feedback that was gathered over a thousand members of this community uh, back in the spring of 2022. Um, all of this information has been made widely available for those that maybe just, and hopefully that's not the case, joining this conversation now. We have worked very diligently to try and um, keep records of all of the presentations and all of the material on our school website, specifically under school start time. But those five, or those many down the bottom there, um, that they emerge from that feedback uh, from well over a thousand, and, and thanks again for our pause group who helped facilitate this. And what you can see there is the comparison between the two schedules. Again, the schedule that is being proposed uh, and the current schedule here. Um, and how each does or does not support what those various priorities were that emerged there that you can see listed. Um, and so, uh, again, thank you for the suggestion for this. This seems, in many respects, as I've taken a look at this, and thanks to Ms. Ingersoll who, who created this for us, really kind of a good uh, punctuation mark, I guess, if you will, on where we find ourselves. Um, 
what we have right now or will have in terms of the schedule, what this new proposed schedule is, and to the degree that that does or does not align with um, these priorities that um, many in our community had identified last spring. Um, as, as suggested in the memo before you tonight, I, I think that what you have uh, granted as a daunting task are, are a few options. And I've tried to outline those in the memo, as, as, at least as I see them. You may have other thoughts, but those, those, are, those are mine, and I'll, and I'll stop there with, with that. Okay. One quick point sure. of clarification, Dr. Brand. The, the, the portion on the right up there is the, the default schedule if we don't make a change due to changes on school on school start time. It is not this year's schedule. It is the 2023-2024 schedule with additional time Forgive on Forgive me, that, right? that's a very important point, thank you. So that is not where we are today. It, the, the two choices shown in this slide are additional time on learning or <clears throat> additional time on learning plus scheduling changes. So. Then, Sorry, I'm thinking of a way to craft what I wanna say about why that's important. <laughs> Well, the, the reason why I know why can you yeah, yeah. so I, mean, I think it's important for us to be able to see the end times what it would be with that additional 15 minutes so that as we're thinking through as I know we've all been just really this has probably been one of the major things on our minds um, for the last <clears throat> few weeks if not longer to you know to look at it and say okay the north and then the west would be 315 okay wait now the north is 320 like to start to just see like the big picture of it right so we don't get caught um, in the what we think of as this great change. We're like, okay, but wait a minute, it would look like this with the additional 15 minutes. So it's important to, I think, keep all of that in mind um, as we start to make a decision. Did you want to add anything to that? I, I, I tried to do some summary notes kind of of the process and yeah. some of what we did through the more recent work. And I could read through that if you'd like, if that would be helpful. That's fine with me. Mrs. Burns, do you want to go first or do you want him to summarize for us well why don't you summarize first because it, it may um it may weigh on what i was going to say okay so thank you partly through the, the this process and, and my recent more recent <coughs> involvement but also through where we've, we've been so for many years even well before the middlesex league discussions that happened the town of wilmington has been and the school committee have been concerned about school start time um it, it, the topic and, and its impacts on adolescence has been well discussed it's been clear to many in the community that for many years our school start times for middle school and high school are, are, are problematic. Um, last spring we had an extensive review of several options and could not arrive at a solution. We sat here back in May and, and voted no yeah. to the, any of the choices because none of them were supported enough by the community. Um, but we did come out of that with some very valuable information, particularly as, as gathered by PAWS um, and the, the, the thousand person people, over a thousand people who responded to that survey. So we got a lot of very, very valuable information. And then during the fall, Ms. Fretra created this alternative proposal based in part on better data. So she was able to go back and review post-COVID where we were with ridership and what, she, what possibilities emerged from that. Um, during this, since then, we've had a new review process where we had community forums and staff forums that brought more than 250 people out to meetings either in person or virtually. And we got the countless comments, written comments as well. Um, even people such as Mrs. Quinn, one of our, our staff members, gave very thoughtful comments here to us, and she thoughtful and detailed comments. We do have to make a decision tonight. There is no staying where we are. We're either deciding to move our start times and end times, and some of them are forward and at, at either end, with the additional time on learning, or we're going to make a change to a new schedule based on this proposal. So there is not a stay where we are option because we changed time on learning that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so then going through the goals, we, the first thing we're all here about is the students. So what's the impact of the students? And then be, for, beyond that, what aligns with parental goals and just as importantly, what supports our teachers and educators as they work for our, in their mission. So the new proposal does move the middle school and high school to eight and it aligns with the goal that's viewed most critically for the students. The new proposal is aligned with the other major topics from most of the parents. This is primarily reflected in that slide, um, and, but it's clear, it's very well understood that there's a huge range of parental views. No, nothing we do will fully satisfy the parents. We're, there's no way that's possible. We've learned that 
very clearly through this process. There's, there's, no, there's no magic answer. It's also clear that the teachers support changes that benefit students, but it's also clear that the Wildwood staff has had some concerns and challenges with this proposal. Um, personally, I believe we do need to make a change. I'm certainly open to the, co the concept proposed that perhaps the, alter, uh, option, the, the new proposal could shift back five or 10 minutes. I would very much like to hear from, from the other folks on the committee as to your thoughts on that. It is beneficial to the ballot well, but then it, there's obviously the problem that that in, impacts at the end of the day to the schools at the end of the schedule. Um, there's the, but I certainly, we've heard very clearly the concern for the Wildwood staff. Um, and, I, and I think that was one of the things we need to make sure we, we consider carefully. Um, so potentially, um, I, I, I'm, I've gotten to the position of supporting the proposal on the right, the newer proposal. I would be very open to it as written or as shifted back 10 minutes. Um, to when you say shifted back 10 minutes. So the 740 would be 750 mm -hmm. for the Wildwood and everything else would shift 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I know that is not going to be popular with some people. But again, we know whatever we do will not be. Yep. So I would, I would be comfortable with either option um, in that regard. Okay. Thank, thank you, you and I appreciate you guys giving me the time. Well, thank you. I mean, you've, everyone has been, I think, really um, invested in this work, but I, you have been at the the heart of, of some of this work, and so we really do appreciate the time. It's like baptism by fire. Welcome to school committee. <laughs> oh, well, you joined this committee. You were like, sure, and yeah, here you are. So sure. we, we thank you. Um, I know you went above and beyond, so we appreciate it. Mrs. Burns. I'll, I'll echo that first and foremost. Um, I do have concerns about starting this this year or next year with the Wildwood in, in such transition. Um, I have, it's not without, it's without question that I, I, I know the research, the research has been there, and it's only, it's, it's supportive year after year. Um, I'm concerned about making this transition this year when we, as a district, are under such transition. Um, I'm concerned that, um, you know, I think it kind of goes beyond, um, you know, you're not gonna serve everybody, and I understand that, but we're talking, we're almost talking about almost a split um, in, the middle school, high school parents of those, and then the, the youngest elementary. And then the, you know, the, the West and North kind of get lost in the middle. Um, it's a half dozen one, half dozen of the other. I, 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 you know, that concerns me um, because there, there is so much, it, there's such a dramatic impact. But the other thing that I don't want to get short-sighted on <clears throat> is that as we move along in this process to consolidate our schools with hopes that will, you know, that may also impact um, our busing schedules all over again. And so you'll have a whole nother transition. I am not proposing to wait until that point, because um, I, I don't think so, but I, I do think, I'm not comfortable with moving into a new schedule uh, outside of what the added time in the school day is going to appear. Um, so readily for, for next year until the Wildwood students and the middle school students for that matter, um, at, at least we, 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 have, we have that taken care of and they're up and running. And I'm not saying, I, I don't think this is a, a waste of time and I, and I think the amount of hard work, I, I don't think we, I don't think it needs to be changed but I think I am one where I don't think the implementa implementation of this is, is for, for the next school year. That's, I just don't feel comfortable. It's, I, 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 mom's intuition. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Burns. Thank you. Um, other comments? Mr. Smaha. Um, so I, I guess, I mean, I can sort of start with sort of my, where I'm coming from um, on this. Um, I, I support the new proposed schedule um, the way it is up there. I think that, like, like Mr. Turner was saying, there, there's no no choice. We're making a choice. And I kind of see it as kind of three different, almost three different choices because I know that part of this conversation also included, hey, there are other towns that charge bus fees, right? How could that then work into this process? Could we enforce the walking to school? 
Um, and I, I just I want to address those two parts of this because I think that the biggest argument that is against the new proposed change is the early start of the Wildwood. I think that is the thing. And so if we say that's the thing, how could we switch the Wildwood's start time to something that would be more reasonable? Because I do agree that 740 is, not, is definitely not ideal. However, to do that means we need to add four school buses, right? That's what's been said. Each of those school buses, I mean, with four, each of those school buses is $75,000. That's $300,000. Considering that budget that we just represented, there's no way we can find $300,000 in our current budget. That, right now, that is the only way, that $300,000 is the only way that we can keep all the other changes and then shift just the wildwood. So that would mean, okay, we got bus fees, the walking to school, right, enforcing that policy. We don't have the sidewalks for that. It's, I don't think that's feasible. I know that people would, you know, parents are able to complain, and I think those complaints end up at the police department, right, and in, in, in the safety of, of, of their children. And we would find ourselves in a place where a whole bunch of kids now are on the bus and now we're, now we're stuck. The other thing would be is adding a bus fee. If you look at the number of students right now that ride the bus, there's about 1,800 students in Wilmington that ride the bus. I don't think that's regular ridership. That's students who have signed up to ride the bus. Um, if we decided that we were gonna, as a district, charge fees so that we could shift the Wildwood School start time um, to address that $300,000, we would need to, first of all, account for the drop in ridership of those 1,800 students who might be riding it, that number would probably go down because people are gonna say, I don't wanna pay this fee. I'll drive my kid to school instead and save that money. Um, we're also gonna have to look at low income. According to DESE, there's about 14.5% of families in Wilmington are considered um, low income. I don't know exactly what the threshold is on that, but so take that 1,800 and subtract about 270 kids from that. Take away a couple other kids that are not gonna join the bus and so you've got say 1,500 kids that want to ride a school bus in Wilmington. That bus riding fee would be $200 per student. So, and if that number is, if that 1,500 is high, if that number goes to 1,200, if it goes to 1,000, if it goes to 1,000, you're looking at $300 per student in bus fees. And I looked around at some other towns, and there are lots of towns that charge that. North Reading charges $400, you know. Uh, uh, Shrewsbury's $320, Newton is $350, um, Walpole's $300, Framingham $250. So there's, these numbers are huge fees. And I do not think that that is an acceptable thing to sort of move forward with, is a bus fee. So I just want to address that because I know there's been lots of comments that I've read that said, hey, why, why don't we do this? Because if you have two or three kids in the Wilmington schools, all of a sudden that price becomes exorbitant. Now I know some of these other towns have family caps. So it's $350 to ride the bus. Like uh, as North Reading is $400, but they cap it at $620 for a family or $520 for a family, something like that. If we decided to do that in Wilmington, that's then gonna, that single price is then going to go up. So I, I really looked into what, that, what it would mean to, for bus fees, for walking, to address just that Wildwood. And I don't think, to me, that doesn't make sense. I don't think families in Wilmington are going to want or be willing to pay that much for bus. That's crazy. Um, so it then brings us down to you know, the, the decision between do we go with the school schedule up there, the 23-24, or do we go with the new one? And when you look at the, what families have said through that survey, when you look at the top, what I did is I looked at the top four reasons. 
the reasons that had over 75% of families saying they either, uh, it's, it, this, thing, this priority is very important or somewhat important. So the alignment with middle school start times, which I know it's, I know it's up there, but that's 86% of families in Wilmington have said that that is either very or somewhat important. 59% say very important, 27% somewhat, 14% say it's not important. High school start times aligning with the research. Again, 59 very important, 30% somewhat important, that's 89%. You go down to look at some of the other things, the high school start times allow students for athletics and extracurriculars, and then start times avoiding kids at the bus stop before 7 a.m. has 77%. Um, either very or somewhat. So when you're looking at this and you're sort of doing this sort of check or, or X like it is up there, those the checks for the middle school start time and the high school start time are overwhelming numbers of 86 and 89 percent. And with this, uh, the uh, not kids having, having not having kids at the bus stop is 77 percent. So the choice in a lot of ways to me is, do I ignore 86, 89, 77% of families and go with the, the 14, 11% that, that don't think it's important? I, don't, I, I can't do that. I think I have to pay attention to the results of this survey and make the, make the decision that's gonna support like what an overwhelming number of parents want and feel, um, and families feel in this town. So I support doing this, and I support doing it for this coming year. I think we have to do it now. We've been talking about this for a really, really long time, and many people might be just jumping on board and figuring out about it, but this has been out there since before the pandemic. Um, it's been out there, I think, before Dr. Brand um, became the superintendent. So it's been out there for five, you know, five plus years. I think we need to make a decision. I think we need to make that decision to go with that new proposed schedule tonight for next year. Thanks, Jay. Next. I know you're all gonna wanna say something, so I'm gonna just go around the table and then. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I have struggled with this um, perhaps more than my colleague, Mr. Samaha and Mr. Turner. Um, and I think that throughout the last several weeks, I get myself into the minutia, right? I've read literally every single comment multiple times. <laughs> and when I go through every single comment, I say, oh, we can't do this. Like, this is, this is too much of a hardship for certain individuals. And then when I zoom my lens back out, I see, you know, I go back to the survey data and, I, and I've read many times in some of the comments, but did you do that survey when people knew what the scenarios were? And the answer to that is no, for very intentional reasons. The way that that survey was created did not present scenarios. It didn't say, would this work for you? It asked people about their priorities because people can get very sort of understandably me focused and how does this impact me versus thinking about this on a district level, on a sort of student focused level. And so I, I really appreciated how the survey was written because it, it actually kind of weeded out that sort of bias around what's gonna work best for me in my work schedule, my kids after school schedule, and that doesn't allow us to get the right kind of perspective. Um, I think that one of my, definitely, my, my biggest um, challenge around this decision has been the Wildwood. And completely acknowledging and, um, you know, feeling incredibly empathic to the situation that is there. Um, and, but then when I zoom out again and I think about what percentage of our district is 
comprised of Wildwood staff. I think my, if I did my numbers right, Jesse couldn't help me. <laughs> um, Jay, maybe you can. I think it's 8% of our staff are Wildwood staff. And if, I, if we do the math and run the numbers on what percent of students make up the Wildwood versus the whole district, it's about 6%. And so it is, it, in this seat, in this position to make a decision like that, it also doesn't seem right to make a decision based on that percent of people and what their needs are. Um, and so I am still curious to hear other board members' perspectives and, and sort of how they've gone through the process. But I have weighed heavily as well on the survey results. Um, and, um, and I appreciate you crunching those numbers, Jay, around um, bus fees. Um, and, you know, I, I think what's been really <clears throat> challenging and, prob and admittedly frustrating is to hear some of the feedback, you know, and some of the solutions that other people are, you know, really trying to suggest and, in terms of you know just come up with the money make this work get these buses um, and you know as you can see from the budget presentation it is not that easy and it is and it doesn't it's not the decision of the, the just the school district to make a decision it it is the whole entire town and not everybody has a child that is in our school district and not all taxpayers in Wilmington are going to support that and so that's it's not as simple as that. Um, the other, you know, I heard a lot of people questioning, still questioning, you know, things like CARES and but will there be enough spots? And at, and at that point, you know, I go, oh gosh, is there? But then I have to step back and I have to say, we have charged, um, you know, certain people with the, the responsibility of saying to us, yes, that is a feasible thing. That is not something that we have to worry about. And I have to say, okay, I trust that that person, um, Patty, is giving us that information, and I, I trust her professional judgment and her years and years of experience with this. Um, so, you know, I am leaning in the direction of supporting this new proposed schedule um, and to begin it this year. Um, I feel confident that our interim solution for the Wildwood is actually going to be a welcome change and will actually create stability for that community finally. Um, so I, I feel like the hardship that they have experienced for the last couple of years is going to be alleviated next year. Um, and so I don't have a concern about the, the timing of that necessarily. Actually, I have greater concerns about the middle school, in fact, because they're experiencing a significant amount of change next year, too, with the moving in of the Wildwood students. Um, but I, I do, I think that the benefits outweigh um, the harm in doing it next year. Um, and I will, I will pause for my colleagues. So, I'm sorry I couldn't help you with your math, by the way. Yeah. Um, I, I too, have, have struggled and am continuing to struggle. And, you know, I appreciate the, the time and the attention and, and the comments. I've, I've read all the comments and survey results as well. And, you know, respectfully, I think there are some parts in this plan that, that I don't like. But I find those as... Uh, sort of pieces of a whole, right? I don't love that the Wildwood moves up an hour. Uh, I don't particularly like reading that the middle school and the high school kids will be on the same buses together. They, there are pieces of plans that I just, I, I don't love. But then, much like Melissa was saying, when I sort of zoom out and look at it overall, I think sitting in this seat charged with making the decision that we think is best for the, the school community as a whole, um, I think we've landed on, sort of to what Dr. Brand said at the beginning, the best option 
under the constraints we find ourselves under. That's where I am. Thanks, Jesse. All right, David, you're up. <laughs> um, this is really tough. Uh, it's one of those choices that no matter what you make, no matter what choice you make, um, some people are going to be upset and completely justifiably upset. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. With absolutely, with absolute justification, people are going to be upset. Um, if we, you know, if we change the start times of the schools, it is going to cause disruption in many families' lives. Um, and that's, that's real, it can't be ignored. Um, that's just something how this works. Um, and it's also going to not just affect our families, but it's going to affect our staff. If your job hours change, then that affects how you get your own kids off to the school, off to school or onto the bus, uh, any other activities you might do before school or after school. I mean, that's an equally big change uh, for our staff. So. Um, you know, this whole thing is, you know, it's, it's kind of fraught either way we go. And uh, there are a lot, of, <clears throat> a lot of reasons to be concerned about making this type of change. Uh, and we have heard that loud and clear. We've received more than 100 pieces of written feedback. And, uh, and I know that, <clears throat> you know, I've, like, I, I've read them originally and I read them again in the last two days. Uh, and, you know, we have heard <laughs> people's concerns. And they're absolutely real, and uh, and and I don't uh, I don't belittle them um, at all. Considered every comment. One of the things that I've also tried to think about in terms of making this decision is to put aside things that, in the end, aren't really what it's about. So, it's been already mentioned that this is something that we've been thinking about for a long time, uh, and it's been something I've been thinking about even before I was on the on the committee uh, about this issue with our school start times. Uh, so there's a a temptation to let that push us in a particular direction just because, my God, we've been thinking about it for so long. Mm -hmm. We put so much work into it. We spent so many hours coming up with these scenarios. And then the idea of just kind of just saying, nope, let's just kind of not do that and stick with more, more or less what we have. I mean, that's kind of tough. And it's a little bit like the sunk cost fallacy, that any time you've spent a lot of you know, money, time, effort of any kind working on something, you hate the idea that it was all for nothing and that you're not gonna get some benefit from that. Um, but in the end, we have a choice before us and it's just a question of which is all things considered the best option? Uh, which has the most benefits? Which causes the least harm? In the end, I'm, I'm trying to put aside as much as possible however much work got us to this point. The fact is we are at this point and we have the two options before us and we need to select the one um, that we think is that we think is best overall. Uh, another thing that's hard about this is we need to think about you know we need to try and make the best decision for the district as a whole. But this is a case in which there kind of is no district as a whole. Um, the district in this case is not the sum of its parts uh, because a benefit that family A gets doesn't compensate for a detriment that is experienced by family B. And if the high school has certain benefits from getting a later start time, that doesn't compensate Wildwood, which is getting uh, an earlier start time. And so the, the, the pieces, it, it's, all, it's tough to make that type of decision. If I'm making a decision for myself, uh, then I can consider all the trade-offs and say, well, in the end, I get this benefit and I'm willing to trade it for, um, for this other thing. And, uh, and there, there can't be anything quite like that with a school district with all the families and students. And, uh, and staff that we serve. Uh, so that's part of what I'm thinking about, kind of almost the, just how do you make these types of decisions. Um, disruption also can't be a veto. Uh, so um, any kind of change of this nature is going to um, be, you know, is going to be an inconvenience and in many cases a major inconvenience uh, for certain families and staff. Uh, but if that was the only consideration, we'd never make any changes. So we also can't just say that, although it's real, that therefore we're simply not going to do it. Um, so again, a lot of it just comes down to which is the best option, all things considered. And when I try to consider these choices, um, we're used to what we have now, but that also can't be a reason to keep it just because of that. It's like, of course we're used to it. We've had no choice but to be used to it. 
Um, it's been more or less a fact of life what the current start times are, so we've molded our lives around it. Um, and, uh, and so again, thinking, try again, as best I can, balancing everything. Um, the start times we have now are really bad. And of course, it's different trade-offs than the one that we would be making if we changed to this, uh, to this new plan. Uh, but what we have now is very bad, and I think it can't stand. Um, we have, have had you know, a lot of trouble. <laughs> we, this is no secret to people who have been on this committee or watching these meetings, that we've had a lot of issues with our middle school over the last several years. And we have some good momentum going there. But I am absolutely convinced that one of the reasons is the start time. It simply starts way too early, much earlier than anything we're contemplating now in the new plan, even though, again, that's not necessarily ideal in all circumstances. And while the high school is better, it's still not good. And so we're looking at seven consecutive years of students attending schools that start too early. And that has to change. Uh, and it's, I'm not trying to suggest that <clears throat> essentially the, you know, not trying to set different schools against each other or say that, that, uh, that, the, you know, that, the, that some families get to say, like, well, you had the good start times long enough. Now it's our turn. <laughs> um, and my family and, of course, many families as we move to the district are in all of them. So I'm in the elementary schools and the middle schools and the high schools. And we're going to move on through. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I think that, as I said, it just comes down to the two choices we have and all things considered, as best we can make the choice, what is the best option? Um, I think that, or as I often type the phrase things, which is the least bad option? We don't have any great options. Um, but I think that what we have now is worse than what we are proposing to change to. And I intend to support the new proposal. Thank you. Um, so I, am, I have very similar comments to most of you. When I am thinking about this, well, one, I'm so fortunate to sit in this, in this role because I get to see how you've all so committed to making the best decision with your questions and your requests for information from Paul and Glenn. Poor Paul and Glenn. Can we have this? Can we have that? Can we have this? Can we have that? I, but it just, I just hope the community knows this is not something we take. I mean, I think they can see we don't take this lightly. But when I say they don't take this lightly, I mean, it has permeated our thoughts. Um, for weeks now and for some of us probably longer than that so it is definitely something that we have to keep coming back to and for me similar to my colleagues it's for me it's the big it's the big picture and it's and it's not about trade-offs it's about thinking about the whole child from from the pre-k all the way through and so i'm trying to think of this as what is best for for the grant the whole child that goes starts with us and ends with us and so you may be at a kindergarten for for one year but you are headed to the middle and the high school. And when you get to that middle school, if you have young children and you're headed there, I would say most middle school parents that I have um, engaged with through this process or just that I've met along the way would all agree that it is not just difficult, it is almost excruciating to have a 720 start time for our most vulnerable youth, for our students who we have committed as a school committee to support. We've invested tons of time. We've invested M AMLE into the middle. We have said, this is a major issue for us. We are, our kids are not getting what they need. We have it in survey data. They are not getting what they need. They don't feel like they belong. We have rates of depression and anxiety. We're, we see this and we're saying we're investing. One of our strategic goals is social emotional learning. We are investing in that. So I look at this as I pull myself back and I say, okay, this is going to be tricky and this is not an easy decision, but what is meeting our strategic objective? What have we said as a school? What have we supported? In Glenn's goals, we have supported this. And for, for me to then say, I know all that, but people aren't gonna be happy, it just isn't, I don't feel he's doing my job as a school committee member. Maybe as a parent, maybe to say, it's going to, my life's gonna adjust in a way that isn't easy for me. And that can go either way for people who are starting earlier next year and people who are starting later, people's lives are going to change no matter what we decide. People are going to have to drop off earlier or go into work later, things are going to change. And so I look at that 720, just like David said, and I'm like, I cannot believe we have had that for so long when the research is so, so incredibly deep in this area that has told us 
for over 12 years, this is not an acceptable start time for 12 through 14 year olds. It is just not acceptable. And so for me to say, oh gosh, just don't really, people are gonna be, and they are, and it's going to be life changing and I'm not diminishing that at all. But I cannot look at that schedule on the left and say I'm doing my job as a school committee member. And then say, okay, good, bring in AMLE and let's do more surveys. And let's not change something we believe is truly at the, like the real center of some of our issues there. The early start time, the lack of sleep, and then getting out at 145 without acceptable afternoon activities. I mean, there's just so much we have sat in this room and said together, it's not okay, it's not okay, it's not okay. Now's our chance to make it a little bit more okay. I think actually quite good. I mean, this eight to 225, and that's what I keep going to. Um, I will not have a child in the middle school next year. That time has, is gone for me. I will not benefit from this time, right? This is, but I'm thinking about all of those who are coming up after and I'm saying, it is not okay. And I can't sit here and do my job as a school committee member and say, let's just hold off and wait till we have a new building. I think it is detrimental. And I think that idea of thinking that is seven years of times that we know is not acceptable. Um, and so for me, it's not easy, but I cannot imagine not voting for the new proposed schedule tonight. So that's where I stand. I think we've all said our piece. Does anyone want to add anything else? May I just one clarifying point, and maybe Mr. Turner, you're going to raise that, but about your point that you uh, mentioned earlier about that idea of shifting the Wildwood. So that was one topic that we've discussed at different times. And, and since I'm going there again, thank you all very much. I do appreciate it. And, and the, the amount of time and thought all of you have spent on this is, is amazing to me. And, and I, I appreciate that personally as, as a member of the committee and a parent. Um, the, the only open question that, that, remain, that, that I see with that new proposal is um, we could adjust it, start the first one at 740 or, uh, 745 or 750. The challenge there obviously is the other end of the schedule. Um, and, and that obviously impacts people at Woo Vernon North. Um, and again, we have, and, and the start time at Woo Vernon North would also fall. It would put increased pressure on CARES for sure if it drops past nine o'clock. And that's, that in some ways, one of the proposals we had that we got survey results on was the difficulty of anything starting after nine yep. um, is also very well raised. And so it is a, to some of the comments made, it's an additional disruption um, and may requ require further care support at the Woburn and North. Um, but with regard to the Wildwood and, and the level of, of change there, it would drop that change from an hour to 50 minutes or 55 minutes. And so I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I, I, I go back and forth and, and to the comments about the, the, the amount of mental effort, the mental cycles on this. Yeah, the, the number of times I've asked myself the same question or asked other people the same question is, is countless. Um, and so I've, I've gone back and forth on this. I actually literally have said no to Dr. Brand three different times that I didn't think shifting it back was a good idea. But the fourth time we discussed it, I said, well, maybe, maybe it does benefit, provide a little bit more benefit. Some of the comments we heard from the Wildwood about just the difficulty of that time, what if it was five or 10 minutes? And so I go to some of those comments we got from the Wildwood and, and I, I, I'm open to it. And I, I, don't, I don't know um, for sure how I feel about that particular nuance. I'll start. I would be comfortable with 745. I think it still keeps us before that 3.30. Okay. But I feel like the 7.50 and then the exit at 3.00, just for me, just seems like a little, I know, and I'm not sure that five minutes is worth it, but it could be. I mean, it gives you just a bit more time. Um, so I would be comfortable at 7.45, but I, would, I don't think I'd be comfortable at 7.50. Others? I mean, I, I, would, so. I would like to do something to show the Wildwood staff that have young children, because I, I heard that a lot. On the flip side, though, I think there have got to be lots of parents, you know, lots of teachers at the middle school. What have they done for the last however long? Like, they have, they have to be in the building by 7.15. How have they been doing it? So I go back and forth because then that competes with the families that have said, 
my child isn't going to get home in time to make it to CCD. And I think those are important, you know, extracurriculars as well. However, I also know that when my kids have gone through the different schools and our after school activities learn that we can't get there, literally we can't get there until like whatever time, there's shift, the community, I, I'm, I'm hopeful mm -hmm. that our community, you know, programs are gonna partner with us and, and, and maybe we can do things as a district to sort of communicate with our, our partners in the community um, who run these after school programs and offerings for kids to be able to work with us around this and support this initiative as well. Um, so it's, you know, you're sort of, you're giving and taking, but I, I'm, I guess I, I lean in the direction of supporting our, our Wildwood staff in making this significant change um, more helpful to them by shifting it um, as well. And, and I think I would agree with, you know, a 745. Anybody else? Um, I, I would be, I would be open to 745, and I would be open to 750 um, as well. Again, it, it's not ideal, but but I think uh, what Ms. Baumann, uh, Mrs. Baumann had said about offering, you know, something to the Wildwood because it's such a drastic shift for them, um, that I would be, I would be open to 745 or 750. <laughs> David? Uh, I struggle a little bit with this because I, I don't really have a sense of how much it will really help. Mm -hmm. Is this, you know, is this going to be su substantially? I mean, I don't want it to just be a gesture. Like, as, mm -hmm. because I, of course, feel the same as everyone that just like, God, the wild was just the sticking yeah. point on the, on the schedule. Uh, and, but I, I don't want it to, the decision to just be like, well, can we give them something? And if it's not going to appreciably change the situation, uh, then I think we need to be a little bit hesitant about that. And I, I really just wonder if like, there's just such a small difference is going to really move the needle uh, on that situation. Um, I also want to actually just address uh, something about the middle school that you mentioned, because I kind of had a little bit of that same thought of just like, well, God, we must have some middle school teachers with young kids. And it's just like somehow they've managed to make it work. Uh, with uh, you know with, with child care with an even earlier start time um, but of course the middle school has had that start time forever so it's a self-selecting population like the people who choose to work mm -hmm. there or apply there know, know. Yeah. <laughs> what they're getting into know what, know what the when the school starts mm -hmm. and have found some way whether it's through you know their kids are older or they have family who can watch them or daycare whatever the situation is that you know that the, the people who can't make that work don't choose to uh, try to work at that school mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's always going to be a little bit different when you've already kind of planned your schedule around what the situation what the situation was yeah. um, so I, I think I'm inclined to stay with where where we are on the proposal um, but that's because my my perception is that shifting five or even ten minutes is not going to really move the needle uh, on that on that issue, and I think it will cause more problems on the back end with other schools starting after nine o'clock and getting out even later. MJ, I'm not. For me, it's a half a dozen one, half a mm -hmm. dozen the other. Actually, I think those people that would uh, benefit aren't here to speak for themselves. I, in that sense, uh, I. You know, I, I think the only crux, I'm not, I, you know, I, not to say that's not a priority, but I think it would make a positive difference, possibly, but I think the biggest crux for me is the implementation of the schedule. That's, I think this, that's the deciding the factor. I'm not against it. I'm not, in, in you know, especially hearing the discussion for me, I'm, I'm not against it, but I, I have, I do, I have grave concerns and I think it'll speak to um, I'm not saying, you know, I don't, I think it'll speak to how do you figure it out with our Wildwood staff, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, things evolve and change, you know, and, you know, and I just think there's a lot going, going on in the middle school in with, you know, just with the interim, interim plan. And I, I just think, um, 
giving it just giving it a buffer year and implement it in the following year, I think may make for a smoother process in, in the long run for both the new plan to sink in, and this is what the preparation is, and having perfectly capable time to accommodate that. You know, I, that's, I think that's really where my crux is um, uh, right now. Um, but just, you know, simply just letting you know. <laughs> I, just, I just want to remind, but when we did look at school start times last year, it was, what month was it? April? April, May. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, so I mean, I just keep, I keep, I think the same. I mean, I have everything you've all said. I'm sure we're all saying, oh, I thought the same thing. I mean, I sat there and said, can't we switch the wildwood in the back? Can't we do that? I mean, like everything that was asked in those forums, I said, yep. I thought this, I asked the same thing, you know, and was so disappointed when they said, we tried, we looked at that and here's why we couldn't do that. I mean, I, poor Steven, I was like, wait, but can't we do this? And why can't we do that? You know, um, and I, you know, I feel like that last year we were, it was eight, we would have changed it so much closer um, to the start of the school year with very little time. And, and here we are in, in January. So I've tried to remind myself of that, um, that it, there is quite a bit more time to wrap your head around it now than it would have been had we made a decision to change everything. I know that that doesn't make it any easier, but it's helped me to think through the process a little bit differently. We um, didn't have to deal with a school within a school either. I know, so. no, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Although, um, yeah, I know. And, and, and people may not weigh, weigh that as much as yeah. I do, but. So, to, Steven. Can I ask a question to follow up to David's point? Because part of why I struggled with the idea of moving it a few, five or 10 minutes was, is it impactful? And so the question, and part of my answer was that the, the level of feedback from the Wildwood staff that anything would help kind of came to mind. And then the other question to you, Dr. Brand, is in your conversations with Ms. Bissell, have you gotten a sense from her, is five, and, and her views of the staff, her, her interaction with the staff, is five minutes impactful, is 10 minutes impactful, or will it really be a token, because a, mm. a token gesture doesn't help anyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if it's a token gesture, we shouldn't do it. If it's if, if five minutes isn't impactful and it would have to be 10, that's one decision. If it have to be something different. So did, did you get a sense of feedback as a collective sort of how much would it help? Uh, I don't have specific okay. uh, insight in terms of that. Um, I, I, I Rightly or wrongly, I didn't go down that path, uh, if you will, in terms of trying to get more information on say those staff of the wildwood who may be affected by this i mean i i think there's clearly and you've heard from them some 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 compliment of the wildwood staff who this certainly will impact uh it's also my understanding there's some that this may not be as much of an adjustment could certainly be an adjustment for staff and some of the other schools that are shifting uh, as, as well too so my sense though is is and it's my, my sense based upon also reading that feedback as you've seen, I think, I'm not sure that five or 10 minutes in and of itself will make a significant enough difference for those that, uh, for those staff who may have to make some large changes for their, their own personal care situations. Yeah, but so, I mean, but 7.45 does feel a little bit more reasonable. Although funny enough, because the height, the high school, it's funny how you lose sight of what exists right now 740 actually feels pretty reasonable I, that has not been the time that has like been as, as troublesome to me as the as the 720 you know so it's a part of me says well if 740 was okay at the high school then it should be okay you know but it is that that major shift for them that that keeps bringing me back to 745 does seem a bit more reasonable than a 740 time um you can drop off at 7.30, you could probably still, like, depending on where you drop off, I mean, it's not, <clears throat> just to provide, to provide you just a bit more of a cushion. I mean, I think about it from an operational standpoint, too. So, you know, for teachers who have to drop kids at daycare at 7.30, then they're, you know, they're getting back in their car at maybe 7.35 if the drop off goes smoothly, right? right? Um, it gives them 10 minutes. So let's say they're at the Wonder Years, you know, child care center, whatever. Um, you know, I want to make sure that staff are able to be ready and present and ready to receive students in their classroom. And I've always felt like 
minutes in a school building do matter you know when I am in a school and like a minute can feel like an eternity in a school sometimes I don't know why time is different in school I, than I don't know either at home. <laughs> Definitely. but um you know we're on a bell schedule the bell rings at 7 32 uh, you know, so I feel like five minutes could be really helpful um I wish I had other people to run that by, but I, I don't know. Okay. Your motion? I'll make a motion to, well, let me think about this for a second. You wanna do Mr. Simone? <laughs> because the question, because the question would be, are, are we making a motion about the new proposed schedule or would the motion be about adjusting to 745? I think um, you could make the motion to I'm gonna adjust make the, to I'm going to make the motion to, to adjust the new proposed schedule to 745, adjust it by five minutes later. Okay. Is there a second? All right. So now we're voting on that, but actually we're voting on the the whole schedule here so if you're voting now you're voting on the five minute change because it doesn't make sense you're voting on that then you're voting on the schedule so there's no sense but in then, taking two votes but well i think you could the motion need to be to approve, approve. okay so fine so, so i think i think if we right fair we, enough i think this is two motions, two motions? okay motion. so there's a okay so a motion and a second all in favor of changing it to 745. Second, whatever, whoever seconded it. Two, three, that's. No final analyzed down. Five. <laughs> yeah, that's correct, Teresa. <laughs> okay. Now we need a motion for the schedule. To be implemented when, though? That's the question. Yeah. That'll be part of the That'll motion. That'll be part of the motion. So I'll make a motion? Again. All right. Let's just smile I, for the win. I will make a motion to uh, accept the new proposed schedule as amended for the 2023-2024 school year. Is there a second, Mr. Turner? All in favor? Oh, discussion? No, no more discussion. All in favor, sorry. Well, wait, wait. I'm I, kidding, I, I'm kidding, okay, okay, stop. Discussion. Discussion. I'd like to amend Mr. Samaha's um, oh, okay. motion Yeah. Um, for the new proposed schedule to be the new corrected proposed schedule to be implemented in the 2024-25 school year. Yes, thank you. Okay, is there a second? Okay, so the motion fails. So now we go back to the original amended motion, which is the new proposed schedule 23-24, Wildwood start time 745, everything else by five minutes. There is a motion and a second. Is there mm -hmm. any more discussion? Okay, all in favor? Against? Okay. All right. I'm done. I have to go. No, I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. Thank you, um, Stephen, for all you did. And all you've done and your dedication. And the next few days we will be will be tough and we will persevere and we will know that we we did our work and we made the best decision in the best interest of of all of our children in this mm -hmm. district and and that's the best we can do and people who put us in this position um, hopefully will know that they can trust us to make the best decision for their kids so. it's not easy sitting in these seats Wilmington <laughs> okay um, next we have subcommittee reports are there any subcommittee reports there's lots of subcommittee meetings upcoming, I've seen. Mm -hmm. Lots of links, lots of things in my box, in my inbox. Um, yeah, I have a few. Um, so WEF met in uh, January 10th. Um, so it's officially grant awarding season with deadlines approaching for applications. So um, just for you know, staff, teachers who are watching, um, the curriculum application deadlines are, is January 31st. Okay. Um, the Ed Exploration grant application deadline is February 28th. And the Tech Ed grant application deadline is March 31st. 
um, WEF historically um, provides f some financial support to um, the STEM fair, which is returning this year for the first time after COVID, um, and is scheduled right now for Tuesday, March 28th from 5.30 to 7.30. Um, and we don't have a confirmed date yet for the art fair, and um, but looking forward to that too. Um, CPAC meets, what's today, Wednesday, tomorrow. Um, those <laughs> meetings are virtual and everyone's welcome. Agendas and meeting links are on the district webpage under families, under the families and community tab. Um, and I actually believe that um, a representative from the Federation um, uh, mm. for children with special needs will actually be in attendance for that meeting. So um, so that that will be um, good to connect tomorrow. The art show is slated for May 5th and 6th. Oh, great. I'll make sure they know. Um, and I feel like there's more. I mean, family engagement, we're meeting pretty regularly. We have a meeting. When do we have that meeting? <laughs> <laughs> there's so many things going around. But yeah, is that Monday? It's Monday, Monday at six. Because no. Monday is equity. Uh, oh, Monday, no, Monday is, is also the equity. Equity. Subcommittee. I think yep. family is that. That night too. And, and the and the the budget board presentation of at the board of select. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a busy it's a busy Can day. I, yeah. Point of clarification: When's town meeting? Is it the sixth for Saturday in May? I thought it was the no, 29th. It's April. The end, of April. end of April. Okay. It's 429, you. I believe. Yeah. It's 429. Thank you. Oh, you're impressed. Thank you. Yes, How did I know that? Oh, wow. <laughs> Give it to the numbers guy. Um, the Google calendar. Yeah, so lots of upcoming <laughs> meetings, so lots of reports at our, at our next meeting. Um, David. Uh, the policy subcommittee met on January 5th, and uh, we discussed uh, some of the transportation policy and field trip uh, policy and public comment policy. Um, we, I think, ended up uh, in a place where we didn't think that the field trip policy at the school committee level needed any alterations, but that there was some work that was going to um, go back to the uh, administration for um, unifying some of the policy and making sure that there's more consistency uh, across schools, um, in particular across the sides, the sides of town. Uh, and uh, we looked at the model public comment policy from MASC as well as uh, some others from uh, from surrounding surrounding districts, and we're going to bring some uh, possibilities back to the subcommittee for some further discussion um, before possibly bringing revisions to the full committee. Okay, excellent. Thank you for the update. Anything else? Correspondence, Mrs. Burns. None this evening. All right. Um, so, town manager budget is this coming Monday night at Town Hall. February 15th is our next regular session meeting and our budget hearing at 7 p.m. here in this room. And then we have March 8th um, because of the school vacation. So we have one meeting in February and then we'll have two meetings in March. Sound good? All right, if there's nothing further, just a motion to adjourn, please. Mr. Turner, seconded by Mrs. Burns. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you and Thank good you night. Thank you very much, folks. Good night.